Hi, my name's Uncompetitive, and this video is called Uncompetitive Reacts to Eric Weinstein's Geometric Unity Lecture. Reacts to Eric Weinstein's Geometric Unity Lecture. I don't know if it's cut off the beginning. Let's just go back. Hi, my name's Uncompetitive. Oh, that's all right. Okay, we're all on there. Okay. And um, we need to go forward to there. There. Okay. Right. And um, we need to mute. And then we need to set this up. So I've got it plugged in. And we also need um, the telephone because what I found was that if I do any annotations to things, it can switch it out of being a, a shared screen. So I did a thing the other day and I was annotating something for five hours and it was really good and then i found out that it hadn't shared the screen it had done it for like 20 minutes and then it gave up so although i had the resultant image all the bits of me talking and me circling something and saying this thing in the image um had gone um that wasn't being streamed out so that's the fault of StreamYards. Um, but it's also my fault because I didn't have a second way into the stream, which is, um, that's not it. It's two weeks ago. Here we go. That's it. So, uh, yeah. So we've got ourselves on here. So there we are, and uh, that's the stream delay. Right, so I can see this on here, even if I have the um, iPad and I'm drawing on the iPad. And this is going to lose charge, but um, we will see how we go on with that. So, um, no introduction, um, because we want to get going on this how do we how do i get back to <laughs> what have i done i did move the mouse um i'm gonna have to be really careful aren't i to get back to what i was doing can i just click on that what happens if i do this oh that's okay right so what i want to do is I want to um, quickly um, bring up share screen, entire screen, entire screen there. And I want to hide that bit there. I want to drag this down so I can see the clock. So this is the thumbnail in all its glory. I can actually put that over there probably. Um, let's see who's in the corner there. No one that important. Put him on top of um, Edward Witten. Right, there you go. So I need to see what the time is in the stream because I might run on for 12 hours. Um, I did a stream that was 14 and a half hours. Um, it, what happens is the first two and a half hours does not get uh, covered. And um, what's nice is that I can kind of say, you know, this is the thumbnail, but obviously this is a thumbnail from a different stream. And that represents the chi chimera, which is a beast from Roman mythology. And I thought that was an appropriate thing to put in the thumbnail. And then over here, you see 
this thing um, C and that is the Kaimote Fibre Bundle as it is in the notation of Eric Weinstein's theory and then we go over to um, oh it's it's not doing it correctly this isn't the thing that I had oh I know what it is done oh I see this is what I worked on and this isn't the image that I had for the yeah 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 I annotated this to get to something else let's get to the something else so I have um physics uh let's see it will be documents it will be this this that's it so that would be it and um there we go that's the actual thumbnail interesting so it's quite a difference between that and uh what was there before if i minimize that and get rid of the file viewer you've got these matroska dolls russian matroska dolls which i was like using to illustrate how groups fit inside groups in the last uh, stream that i did and i thought well that's just untidy now and all this stuff down here was untidy and so i just thought right let's have a general clean up and let's go and um i can't find the image now is this it there that's it so it's it's all cleaned and i've then labeled it so the bit from his book is this thing that looks like a bee and it's actually a w where it's a literal double u okay so the first part of it is that and he has like a a simpler di diagram that he starts off with with in his supplementary slide explainer and he says uh how uh, space time will be distilled into two spaces x and y and then he then goes off and he says um on the you know nearly like the next slide he says um you know you can kind of have it happen again and that gets him to uh reference this other structure now in some of the diagrams it's x y and z but in the 2021 paper he doesn't bother with complicating it with z and he just says we have a dollar sign where the dollar sign represents the spinners and they have a group which is the unitary group 6464 so that is a very important piece of information and it's operating on c so what you see there is c and that is the climate fiber bundle and if you go up here you see c again and c is operating on the manifold y and it's got 14 dimensions so it's got seven of time and seven of space and then that is this thing here in his uh paper y77 and y77 now what i've done is i have made it so that um y is um immersed inside of the chimeric fiber bundle so if you pull back you'll see that the 14 dimensional Erismanian manifold is this sort of wavy thing that's curved and that is what has um the um spinners that are um have the uh, they, they're like they're following the rules set out by the quantum field theory that is defined by the group g 
right so i've taken the liberty to rename the group g in honor of everest galois and here we have it and i've got this space at the top as being the rules and then i have y in a sense observing that in a sense of observing the rules okay and the thing that ends up being observed the thing that is the um single unified field which has all the phenomena that are in um our universe in fact all the phenomena that are in the observerse well i should say um other than um things that are like the geometric curvature of space-time that's um like where things are happening and that's this down here so this um blue thing is the four-dimensional pseudo romanian manifold so you've got two manifolds you've got at the top an erismanian manifold and at the bottom you've got a lower dimensional uh four-dimensional um pseudo romanian manifold right so you've actually got more content dimensionally than you can fit into it so you lose stuff along the way and so when you do a uh, pi one um, which is represented diagrammatically by going around the curve with this little arrow it does usually have an annotation but i just hid that for simplicity um that is the pullback operation which is uh, sampling a partial um bit of the content from omega so in a sense omega splits into bosons and fermions uh Ritter, schwinger matter um the higgs field all of those things because they're all basically um tensors and um did, i'll get to that in a moment but the thing is is that that is the observed so he says in his second slide that is this slide he says um uh, the single unified field omega is dancing on uh y so it's kind of quite poetic that he's like saying it's dancing on y um that's a kind of informal way of describing that it is a pervasive um um field that is represented by spinners that are of the, the uh, unitary group uh, u6464 and they're actually specifically uh wild spinners um, and that's uh, named um, after this guy, um, Herman Wahl. Okay, so that's the type of spinner he's using. And those are actually decomposed from other spinners, which are um, Dirac spinners. So the Dirac spinners are based around complex numbers, but he gets rid of the complex numbers um in transit to setting up this basically this final diagram of the observers so the um where it says that do i have it on here yes i do over here we see um the full size of the group and we have um although it's like on its side i have to fit it in somewhere uh, I have uh, the standard model, and you'll see U1, which is hypercharge, and then SU2, which is isospin. And I forget what SU3 is called, but um, what they are is um, within U1, uh, it's usually annotated U1 EM, you have electromagnetism as a unification of electricity magnetism and all forms of light radiation so that's one kind of unification then wolfgang Pauli 
went along and was like saying we can put this inside of a unitary group and then along came um um it was uh chen ying yang and sung dao li so over here we've got um oh oh hold on running into the uh screensaver wolfgang pauli did the u1 bit as far as i know i mean my history of quantum field theory might be wrong um then um we have um this guy chen ying yang who's still alive he's 100 years old and i had actually forgotten his name off the list so i wrote it in here sideways uh that's song dao li i think that's a fox um so song dao li and uh chen ying yang where is he there chen ying yang and song dao li um were proposing that something that's called parity is broken so there is a thing which is uh, referred to as p symmetry which is the notion that things uh, if you were to put them into a mirror universe the laws of physics would remain unchanged and this is something that wolfgang pauli uh, believed and he thought well there's charge symmetry and there's, there will be pa uh, parity symmetry we've seen it in other things so it seems to be a characteristic of the universe and these things have come from um, conservation laws that have been defined by um, Emmy Noether. So Emmy Noether is a mathematician that did a bit of physics and she drew on the work of Sophus Lee. And Sophus Lee is a guy who um, um, took the work of Everest Galois who was the one who came up with the uh, idea of the group in the first place. And the group is just a set with operations on it, okay? And you can use it to define symmetries. And he said, well, I'd like to have symmetries on manifolds. So we have a, let's see, get the direction right. We've got an Erismanian manifold there, and we have a um, Riemannian manifold or pseudo Romanian manifold there now in terms of uh space time um the kind of manifold we're talking about is uh this one it's x not x4 but x13 and it might seem a bit unfamiliar but what it is is it's time comma space right and this is a way of representing the um with a split signature you're representing space time and you might think well why isn't it three comma one well you can have it be three comma one if you really 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 want to okay but the general convention of all the books uh things that einstein's written is this way round, and there is a reason for it historically that i've covered in other videos but i don't want to bog this down with everything i know about everything i'm re recapping okay so x13 is a four dimensional thing so you've got one dimension of uh time and you've got three dimensions of space right and uh so that'll be like you know the few going into the future and it'll be you know up down left right in out okay those would be your four dimensions and um it's all a continuous thing right so it's not like um, um space is disassociated from time it's all one thing and you can think of it like a kind of fabric of a scarf and you can kind of compress the whole thing down and one way of thinking of it is as a hypercube where you have your four dimensions and uh, that's a representation of a projection of a four-dimensional shape into uh, something that I could then draw there. So that blue thing is hypercube, and it helps if you look it up online and you see it rotating, right? So that thing hasn't been given 
a distinction of it having it's not gone from x4 to x13 if it was x13 you could take out that kind of cube within a cube and you could just have um kind of dust particles moving around within the space because the fact that you're animating something dynamical must mean that you've got time right so there is another way of representing um that uh, four-dimensional space if it is this thing with this um, split signature. The split signature is um, is a case, a special case of pseudo Riemannian manifold, um, and that is uh, based off the geometry of Bernard Riemann originally, and the guy who um, was responsible for that and said, let's have it be this, was this guy, uh, Hendrik Lorentz, okay? So you'll hear talk about Lorentzian um, split signature metrics, and it sounds ghastly, but all it actually means is space-time as represented that way, right? So I'm trying to kind of go through all of this at rapid fire as an introduction to the lecture. So when I get to the lecture, I have these names. These are all the names that he's mentioned in the paper, okay? And some other ones that are essential foundational names to then understand the names and why the names are being mentioned that I put in. And then you've got um, the ones he mentions in the lecture, right? So he will mention in the lecture, for example, um, he'll, he'll mention, um uh, yang and mills and so um they got yang mills now um yang and mills did some other work but we'll get to what work they did in a moment because i'm still talking about the um issue with the um uh song dali and chen ying yang so they were working together to begin with in the 1950s and they were like saying we don't think that peace symmetry is going to be obeyed um, by the um, weak interaction now the weak interaction is what's happening with um, this part of the uh, standard model this part in the middle su2 uh, is gavin is uh, is governing the weak force all right and what you'd expect with um neutrons free from an atom which kind of decay within about i think it's something like 17 minutes i'm not sure that they act them out but they don't last long um a neutron is going to undergo radioactive decay and um the products of the um, thing, you, if you put it in a magnetic field, you would assume if a P symmetry was the case, that in a mirror universe, you get the same results. So for it to be um, the same results, emissions that go that way and emissions that go that way would have to be the same when it was mirrored. So if you, if you had a mirror universe, it would be the same amount of stuff going this way as going this way as when you had it around the other way, right? So it has to be about a 50-50 thing. Otherwise, it's like got a bias to it. And the universe is sinister, right? And they found out it was actually sinister. So um, this woman, um, Chen Xiang Wu, there, often referred to as uh, Madame Wu, uh, did an experiment in order to um, confirm their predictions. So Chen, Ching, Chen Ying Yang and uh, Sung Dao Li uh, had this thing where they had this stuff and it, they basically uh, ended up with the uh, results of the experiment saying that you get um, 
60% of SU2 stuff um, being kind of like left-handed spin and then 40% of it uh, being um, right-handed spin. And that was unexpected by um, Wolfgang Pauli and he was upset because he wanted the universe to be symmetrical and this isn't just like, oh, it's aesthetic reasons. This is because um, Emmy Nertha had said um, the universe is based on conservation laws, which can be derived as a physical, uh, um, that there's a, the, there's a the reason that physics is the way it is, is because of mathematics. And the mathematics is the mathematics of Lee groups according to Sophus Lee, who built on the work of um, Everest Galois, all right? So he took Everest Galois' groups and then he goes off and he marries them with a differential manifold, which is a um, all of these things here that have curvature would be differential manifolds and... Um, there are surfaces in which you can go off and, you know, compute the slope at a, a given point, and then you you go and go step along it infinitesimally. You can see the pixels there. And you step along it infinitesimally, and I've divided that up into little cells, little grid cells, kind of sell the whole thing, and uh, you can't have them be, uh, you know, they need to be smoothly curved, and they can't be like sharp points in them, all right? So they have to be well defined because um, when you kind of get to like do your uh, partial differential equations in order to do the math to um, um, do what you need to do to you know do the stuff, then um, it, it relies on it being a smoothly differential manifold so um that um upset Pauli and he didn't accept when he was told that uh, p symmetry had been broken and he demanded that the experiment be done again and then the experiment was done again by other people and it wasn't that he had a problem with Madame Wu. He was friends with Madame Wu. So it wasn't like, oh, this woman's, you know, doing something and she's obviously messed up. It wasn't that at all. But it was something he um, had trouble accepting because it didn't fit with what he thought the universe would be like on the basis of it went against the mathematics that was... Um, showing off all of these. Hey, I'm no longer, uh, I should have kept my eye on this. I'm no longer streaming the, the screen. Oh no, it's doing it again, isn't it? This is such a good presentation of geometric unity and you can't fucking see it. Hello, young God. Citations of entropy is why everything is irreconcilable. Everyone needs their credit. You know what? I'm going to stop paying for StreamYards after I've done this because it's not any good. Um, I mean, it should do this. I mean, it's if I go back here, it's doing it here, right? It does it for a little bit. And then it's, where did it go wrong? I was talking about the Observerse. So I'm gonna to have to go all the way back to the Observerse, all the way back to that. Oh my God. Right, okay. It's kind of demoralizing uh, when it does this. Um, and you're just thinking, why bother? Um, 
Um, now, I need to... Theory of everyone with Tyler Goldstein. Just use OBS. Uh, keep going. I'm going to... I'm gonna try and keep going. I need to, what I need to do is I need to not look at my phone because it's a small screen, I'm just ignoring it. I'm not used to looking at my phone. I need to not use this for annotations and I need to look at this. And the second it goes weird on me, I'll know, won't I? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Let's have a lower resolution retake of the first bit of the thing. Uh, it's been half an hour. That's not terrible. I had this happen, and I last time I was streaming, and it was five hours, five hours of me drawing stuff and saying, like, you see this thing, and I'm just circling it. That's a blah, 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 right? And then I do an undo. So... Anyone that was listening couldn't see what it was that I was doing because StreamYards had decided to stop showing the screen. So I was like, thanks. That's well worth the money I paid for it. Um, so we're just going to go share screen, entire screen there. And then we go like this and like that. We, oh, we need to have Wolfgang Pauli there. Right, okay. So, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to be, um, right, we, we, we're going to start here. So, the way I began was I was saying that this was my original, um, thing that I made for my thumbnail. And of course, it's not shown the right way up. It is shown uh, normally like the the lion thing is, is standing on its feet horizontally in the YouTube thumbnail. Because you can see the aspect ratio, it would be like that in the YouTube thumbnail. And so this is like as simple as I can make it where you have XD where the D represents D dimensions and YM, where I've needed to have a a, a, a thing meaning the, um, the size of the dimensions on Y. And I thought, well, it can be M for the metric, right? So I'm not going to get too much into this other than to say that the reason I've picked this sculpture is it's a sculpture representing the chimera. And the chimera is a, uh, a, a thing from Roman myth which has the head of a lion and the tail of a snake. So it's like frightening both ends, okay? And so I think this is a quite a good representation of geometric unity because the main thing about geometric unity isn't actually omega the single unified field is actually the chimo fiber bundle, which is like a much more complicated thing, right? And you might have seen videos where he talks about the hot vibration. Uh, the hot vibration doesn't have anything to do with geometric unity. So what happened there is he wanted to have uh, an illustration that he could kind of like say, well, this is, uh, you know, an example of a principal fiber bundle, which we'll get to what that is later. And it's something that you can visualize. People have already done these animations of them because this hot vibration has been around for ages. And um, it isn't the same thing that he's using inside of Geometric Unity. He's using something that's a lot more complicated because his fiber bundle is a chimeric fiber bundle, and it has to go from two different um, geometries. It has to go from a geometry based on the uh, work of Charles Erisman to a geometry based on the work of Bernard Riemann. And I color code them where I use uh, 
pink for the Erismanian manifold, and I use blue for the uh, Riemannian manifold. Kind of like it's like the ocean, right? So this is kind of like a candy floss space, and then this is like the ocean where we are in space time right so that's it helps to color code everything right and then you've got maximum amount of information being transmitted uh, in his paper and this reaction to his lecture which i'll get to presently um but it helps to have a bit of information going in um otherwise everything he says i'm going to have to keep coming back to this to say right this is where this ties into that and i want to set up the screen so i have the transcript and his lecture and then i zoom in on him writing the equations and zoom in on the transcript where they're typescript right and then i can make commentary on that so it won't be as it is here where i've done a kind of overall visual summary of geometric unity, right? So um, this thing here that looks like a B um, is the observers. So you see there in yellow, uh, it says observers, and um, that's um, the main concept of um, geometric unity in terms of like its replacement for um, the universe. So if you look at the supplementary slide explainer that's at the end of the lecture, um, he has some slides and he starts off with a slide and he says uh, it looks like, so I'm positioning it at the top corner of the zoom there, and it's just that, right? And he says um, uh, space time will be distilled into two spaces. And so rather than having space time be, um, you know, one dimension of time and three dimensions of space and be represented by X13, which is this uh, Lorentzian. Uh, split signature metric and um, I went over and scooted over to highlight his name but I'm not going to do it now I want to get get on with things that is a representation of our universe right so when he does a lecture he starts off with x4 I'm not doing that here because I'm going to the culmination of everything after it's got itself into some organization and it's recovered space time so this is like the end of the story the conclusion and the goal okay and you need to kind of have the sense of like where is everything headed and it's like well it's headed to the situation we find ourselves in and then what your reaction to this might be is I don't see why there needs to be 14 dimensions. And it's like, fine, we'll get to that. But I just want to show you it as he presents it in his supplementary slide explainer. So he had the lecture. Then he thought he might have made a lecture not that uh, well conveyed. And as he was putting it out for people who were followers of his portal podcast, well, portal podcast, he thought, you know, that lecture was for people who were studying theoretical physics at Oxford University. Maybe I need to um, at least make it so that the things I write on the blackboard are easier to read by having it typeset. So uh, he does that, he throws in a diagram, he puts in some mathematics he thinks is gonna help people follow what he's doing and it doesn't really help. Um, so when I, consumed that content in 2020 like the introduction the uh, footage from the 2013 lecture and the supplementary side explainer it was completely incomprehensible to me so i'm in the same situation as everyone else um as to it being what is he on about right 
and I kind of had heard of some names that he was mentioning and I thought well I do think he's mentioning these names in the right way in the right contexts right because you're going to have to mention the names of people their surnames to reference the uh, theories that they are famous for so he's not just name dropping uh, for the sake of it it's it's there's a rationale behind that and I thought well, he's obviously knowledgeable about the uh, a whole of um, the history of general relativity everyone was involved with the creation of that it wasn't just Einstein and then the history of mathematics leading up to group theory what established that and then what then gave birth to the quantum field theory and we've had like 70 plus years of people working on that and um so there's a whole bunch of names and these are the names that we have over on the right hand side and so this is like the list and you can go from pythagoras and you can then say right how long is this list and it's like well Pythagoras, Lysippus, uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Epicurus, Erasmus, he's not mentioning all these people. I'm putting them in because I think these are like, you know, if you're going to eliminate people from the list, I think you can eliminate Plato, right? But I'm, I'm not eliminating Socrates from the list. So you go from philosophers to natural philosophers. You got a rass of things who calculate the size of the earth with a stick, right? And casting shadows and stuff. And then you got Isaac Newton, who uh, did work on optics with prisms and getting light out of them and getting the colors of the rainbow. And then doing the first unification by getting them all to converge and then having white light and, and establishing that the, the colors that we see are all. Um, part of white, okay? And then you've got Everest Galois who uh, died in the duel and the, the night before he died in the duel, he had this idea for groups and he was like, I must write it down because I might die. And I don't know whether him staying up all night made him unfit to be in the duel and had he not had the idea, he would have survived and maybe had it like the next year, right? So that's all very tragic because um, it was uh, it really revolutionized mathematics and then physics. And then uh, his work um, was taken up by Sophus Lee, who um, incorporated a um, manifold into it. And then that led to the things like you know these manifold things like the Hermitian manifold and the um pseudo Romanian manifold right so we've got these two manifolds and then we then have um Emmy Nerta and she takes the work of Lee and um she says oh well um these groups describe symmetries and um the, the manifolds uh, describe spaces. So we can go from that to ha have physics that has conservation laws, like the uh, law of conservation of momentum and things like that, are all based out of uh, basic symmetries, like translation symmetries, rotation symmetries, things like that. And uh, I can't go into depth into how that all comes about but it's it's very interesting link between mathematics and physics at a deep level that is like saying hey you know let's postulate that there are symmetries inherent in physics and then you go off and you do your tests and it seems as if there are right there is there are uh, there's a charge symmetry and so you get someone like um where would it be Paul Dirac. Paul Dirac um, was looking for um, to a he's looking to find a relativistic equation for the um, electron, and he does his math, and then it 
spills out with a prediction that there will be another particle that will be positive. And he initially thinks, oh, well, that will be the proton. And then someone, I think it's Heisenberg, points out to him, no, the, the proton has more mass than the electron, so it it couldn't be its kind of uh, partner particle, right, in terms of opposite charge, but exactly the same in every other trait. And although I think it spins in the opposite direction as well. So anyway, he kind of messed up there, but the general idea of like, he has another thing like the electron, but it's positive. That was the idea he had had, and that was correct. So the initial instantiation of the idea was incorrect, but the idea that led to that instant instantiation was not made invalid by him, you know, making that error. And then in being told, well, no, that can't be the case, it, you know, they're not the same mass. Uh, then he went back and thought, well, it's going to be a new particle then. That's the only thing it could possibly be. And then he was like, what do I call it? And it was like, well, it's a positive electron, so I'll call it the positron, right? And so the positron was the first example of something called antimatter. And this has now been confirmed to exist. And there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that will annihilate with matter, right? So that's a what's called C symmetry. And um, you're thinking, okay, we've got you know charge um, where we have um, a, a negative charged electron and we have a positively charged positron. And what's that called is um, C symmetry. Now, um, so we have these symmetries and we also have a, a kind of mirror symmetry that's called uh, parity. And that seems to be applied to the things quite a bit. And so we have a parity um, or mirror symmetry. So if things were in a mirror unit verse, they would be the same. And that can be uh, notated by P symmetry. And then there's another one, which is time symmetry. And that's a bit more controversial because you don't get to actually test it by having things reverse in time. It's more like if you programmed a computer, uh, like you had the ultimate video game that was the universe. And then you said, right, okay, we're now gonna make time go backwards. Um, it would, what would it affect in terms of the other symmetries, right? And what's been found is that it does work, but only if this T symmetry is combined with the other two. And so you get this thing called CPT symmetry. And so the um, universe behaves the same if you invert the charges, so you make all matter into antimatter, you go off and you make it a mirror image, which I think would mean that stuff that's spinning right is then spinning left, uh, because the positron, I think, would be spinning right. And then you then go off and change time. And in changing time, you would um, reverse everything. And so the you have a reversal of the spin direction. And once you've done all that, you end up with getting back to something that looks like um, a consistent thing, similar to where we are, right? Now, as to the other one, which isn't called S symmetry, which is kind of a shame, um, but it's called supersymmetry, probably because of hype, <coughs> that has not been found. And they have been looking for it. And that's a symmetry where they say that for every um, bosonic um, field, 
um, there is an equivalent uh, fermionic um, field. And you might think, well, I don't know what any of that means. And we have here two guys who are pretty important, um, Enrico Fermi and Satyendra Nath Bodes. So Enrico Fermi uh, gave his surname to the fermion, and that's a matter particle. So the fermion uh, would be, for example, um, would be an electron or a quark, which is used to make up a neutron or proton. So that's matter is made out of quarks and you know atoms have got electrons in them. So your atoms are the atoms got more in it than just fermions, but essentially they are kind of the building blocks of um, matter. And then the things that's holding that together, bosons, you then have the quarks held together by gluons. Yes, that's what they're called. And then you also have um, the uh, phenomenon of light being mediated by um, force mediating um, field of photons. And I'm going to endeavor to not call them particles um, and not call them waves. And then you just sidestep the whole problem of like, well, is it a wave or is it a particle? Because it is a field. Okay. So that's why I was saying it's a bosonic field and a fermionic field rather than saying bosons and fermions and fermionic, um, you know, the, the particles. I'm probably going to slip up, right? Because when you're taught this stuff at school, you're taught about this, taught about the fermions and bosons, and then they get into all the particles and they're like, say, right, you've got an atom and it's got um, one or more protons and zero or more neutrons and zero or more electrons. And it's like, okay. And then you find out years later that they lied to you and that the proton doesn't exist. The proton literally doesn't exist because it's just an abstraction of three quarks which are held loosely together by gluons. So really, there are quarks and gluons, but there are not photons. The collection of quark gluons can be conceptually referred to as that, but it's like, it's like talking about um, you know, all the people in this country and saying, oh, well, they're British. And it's like, well, yeah, but that's just a massive abstraction of like saying, you know, what's going on and saying everyone's in this, this is country of Great Britain. And then you start thinking, well, it's an oversimplification by an enormous degree, right? So uh, I can see why they do it. It allows them to draw diagrams of atoms that look like little planetary systems with atoms going around like a moon around a planet and stuff. And that's not what it looks like at all. And they've now got images of atoms and the electrons are kind of like vibrating, uh, kind of smeared out shells. Um, and the electrons are all over the place around the outside of the atom, which not around the outside of the atomic nucleus, which is so small you can't even see it, right? So you don't get to see the component lumps like a, they kind of make it look like it's, a, you know, balls in pool where you have the red and the yellow balls that are going in the triangle. It's like the cluster of those, it's like that's the cluster inside of the nucleus. And the red ones are the protons and the yellow ones are the, the neutrons or whatever. And it's just like, uh, no, that's not what it's like. But, um, you know, they've they tried to change things up a little bit in some YouTube videos more recently, and it ends up, like, completely incomprehensible what the graphics are. So um, there's quite a good video called Quantum Field Theory Visualized, 
um, which I can recommend. And I'll um, let's just bring that up now. Um, we go here. And I'll post this in chat rather than play it. And you, I recommend um, you watch this. So we want that. This, okay? So these boxes aren't the whole of space. They're like a tiny micro section of space. And um, we're going to put this not on this stream, but we're going to go and post this into the chat. And then you can go and look that up at your leisure. Um, we're not directly um, covering anything much to do with that for this explanation of geometric unity, but it is very useful to, to kind of like add to your understanding of um what these things are because um the way i have to approach things is i have to approach things uh, mathematically oh this is another video i did do a reaction to which is to do with the um, um, um the the dirac equation so let's just get rid of that and this is the portal video um um all these things were on top and there's that and then i thought i'd put that away right okay we're back to this that's the paper everything's come to the front okay and there's a paper there and that's the lecture notes and there's there's something funny wrong with um you know user interfaces that you can't just kind of say um I'll send you to the back there's no button to click where you can say i want you to stay on screen but i want you to go to the back of the pile right so it takes everything it takes this and it will put it like that that's what i want so i'm going to write my own window system it doesn't do a lot, but it does that. And you'll see, it'll be like, where has this been all my life? <laughs> this is what I need. Because um, you don't want to stuff things down here where it's like, where are they? What are they? Right? It's not a help to minimize things into something. And when you do that, it just expands the dock. And then it means that it puts all of these things in different picking points from where they were, because they used to be spread out over the whole height. And now, because you've added all these documents in, it means that they're no longer at the same location. So if you kind of go sweep to somewhere, it's like, oh, I thought that would be something else that I'd be clicking on. But it's now changed, you see. So your habituation patterns are all fucked up by every time you do a minimization. So that's bad design, Apple. Now, um, so I have done a bit of design with this. I have made changes to geometric unity. I have made it so that it is not using H anymore. So he says in his paper, the, um, um, well, you we can actually bring it up. We go there and we're gonna say, um, Okay. Let's see, can I find it? Okay, so here he says in the paper on page 24, he says, note the symbol H is being used to denote two different objects, a group and a horizontal vector space. So um, the horizontal vector space in this diagram is here and it is h13 
and um, I can't see a way of changing it from that. It has to be H for horizontal. Um, that's the best use of that symbol. And of course, this one V is V for vertical, right? So um, the he's also using it for um, a group. So this thing here, P of H, is P for the principal fiber bundle of the group H. And that's where he gets his spinners. And that's some of the math that's in his paper with U6464. I hope you can see that there. So I'm not bullshitting when I say it's U6464, right? So just so you can check this for yourself, um, I'm going to post this with this page into the chat and this is actually the main principal bundle and you get u6464 there and you get um it coming out of uh spin 77 and we will cover what that is but all of this thing is to do with um, the Clifford algebras and they're also extending the Lie groups. All these things are Lie groups and that means they are um, um, uh, groups which are sets with operations and they have a differential manifold attached. And that means that they can be used to create a quantum field theory. So Effectively, what you have with spin 77 is something which includes the standard model, right? That's the payoff there. And um, it gets represented in this other way of uh, U6464. Um, so um, now, um, there's a few things in here, kind of little nuances about the uh, frame bundle, and um, uh, we don't need to worry about that too much. But he's got these diagrams like this, and he has that in the paper mathematically, and he's like saying X4 um, uh, comes from Y77, which comes from um, the principal bundle. Uh, where the group is on H and it's like you really shouldn't have used H you should have used G um, now if he uses G elsewhere to mean something else he might do but uh, I think G for the group is uh, a, 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 I recommend he switches to that now he does take suggestions um, I've not emailed him over this and I didn't think of mentioning this when he phoned me up. Uh, so this would be under the category of general feedback, not technical feedback, because my criticisms are not of his ideas in mathematics and physics. Me saying change symbol to another symbol for the uh, for clarity, or there's a spelling mistake on this page, and this is how you would spell that word and he does make spelling mistakes, um, that is under the category of general feedback, right? So, like, for example, you could go and say, right, well, there's actually a mistake on the first page um, typographically, and it's like, what is that number four doing there? Okay, there's a number four. There's no reason for it to be there because this is page number one. And it's just like, yeah, it, I mean, it might be in reference to X4, but unless he's just being cute and slipping in a four, it's, I don't know. I mean, unless it's an attempt at hypnosis, maybe it's an attempt at hypnosis, like you prime people with four and get them used to without them being that conscious of it and then later on when you bring in four 
people don't balk at the fact that they've just put in what is essentially like a magic number. So um, a magic number is when you have a theory and you say, oh, well, it relies on a magic number, although you don't call it that, but it's like it has to have this particular number for everything mathematically to work, um, then, you know, so your, your theory explains where four comes from. Um, and you're saying, do I believe in God? Uh, no, I don't. I'm, I can't. So it's not a question of uh, whether I have a choice in the matter. I, I can't. Um, I have um, had a problem with mental illness for my whole life. And I've been um, sectioned in secure mental health units uh, for having um, religious mania. Okay, so when I have a psychotic nervous breakdown, it manifests as religious mania. And I am not in the slightest bit religious. So I don't know where it's coming from. And um, it's almost like I'm I'm getting very, very heightened uh, hypermania and I'm trying to make sense of the unresolved questions about the universe. And so I um, become ill and then I start seeing patterns and things like car number plates. And then I start, um, like I do numerology and start adding up numbers. And then um, I then, if you end up with a number that's more than one digit, you go off and add the digits again until you have a single number. And then I constructed a theory about what all the numbers you get mean. And then I started acting differently depending on what number I got. So I'd see something, I'd add up the numbers, and I'd think, oh, well, that's a such and such. And that means I now need to do this, right? Uh, and then you get arrested by the police, right? So, um, but that's after like being up for three days and then walking around the town barefoot and stuff like that. So, you know, they kind of like, people are like contacting the police about me because I'm behaving in an odd way. So like, yeah, you know, lock me up, okay? Uh, but it wasn't like causing trouble to anyone. Um, but I, I felt at the time I needed to go for a walk and I needed to change the universe into being um, slightly different rules um, so that it would have um, the ability to allow UAPs to manifest in our reality because the laws of physics didn't allow them to do anything other than just be observed and they are from another parallel dimension which to for, for them to come into our universe they would do them for them to make first contact with us and share technology with us i needed to change the laws of physics and i went through every possible thing i could do to think of doing that with magic basically with with, with witchcraft right i used witchcraft to change the laws of physics and then that led to me making it so UAPs were uh, doing what they're doing. And this is like long before um, all the stuff that's been happening with the UAPs. This is uh, a couple of years ago, and we've now had, you know, they're pushing for disclosure, and they're taking it seriously in Congress, and the Pentagon's taking it seriously. And uh, this is before David Favor was like saying he'd spotted them in his jet and they got proper readings of them. This is before 14, 14 mind, uh, UAPs had uh, harassed the um, USS Omaha. Um, all, all of these things were after I had uh, changed reality, not that I had, that's what I thought I was doing, right? So I, I have this thing where I will think um, um, think myself into being um, 
I, I, I don't necessarily think I'm God, but it's kind of like I'm f filling in a role where if there needs to be not a creator, but a selector, someone who's like says, this universe, make it be that this one is the one that's reified into existence. And then someone else is observing this and they see me do a ritual that's um, witchcraft and they say, that's the funny behavior, that's out of the norm, what's he doing? And then they, that allows them to say, yes, we'll take this one and we'll make this one the one that is actually real. And all the rest of the ones that could be just stay as mathematics. So my thinking at the time for where the universe comes from, it doesn't come from a void, it isn't created uh, by God, it isn't created out of God, where God sacrifices himself to become the universe. My thinking was that there is chaos that's infinite, and this chaos uh, is like an infinite space of possibilities, and within it, there's going to be areas of order. So if you take a coin and you keep flipping it, you do it for long enough, you get heads, um, heads, 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 right? So in the same sense, if you have an infinite probability space, then you would have within it local areas which would have order to them. But it's infinite, so overall, it seems as if it's completely chaotic, right? And then out of those areas of um, out of those areas of order, then you uh, then say, well, none of these are any use to me. They're not even resembling mathematics, right? And you can have something like Wolfram's hypergraph, and you could have that emerge within the structure, and then you could have something within that because it's all infinite. You always got more infinity. And then you'd have that mathematically uh, competentially uh, generate uh, patterns that are then um, uh, rewritten by um, nonlinear, um, acausal um, pattern matching rules, which is what the Rulia does. And then that's interesting as a construction of an idea because in defining it that way, it doesn't have time right? It has a kind of propagation of information across a network, but it doesn't actually have like, do this, then do this, then do this. And in having it be a causal, uh, Wolfram then creates these synthetic toy dimensional universes, which um, uh, computationally um, have, have as an emergence, they have um they spontaneously create their own time which i think is kind of quite clever because it's one of the hardest things about a theory of everything is to kind of like say can we get it so that it gives us time where there was no time before and it doesn't give us time out of a four-dimensional pseudo and man in a manifold which is just space that's where eric gets that's as far as Eric gets back to. With Waltham, he gets back to something where it is just an abstract graph where the graph has nodes that can connect to other nodes. So it's like really, really not like anything where you say, right, this is points in space-time in my manifold. No, it's way, way more um, um, abstract than that. It's a, just a space in which to carry information. And then the um, process of computation, which is the only thing he's allowing himself, um, which is itself very pared down and restrictive in how it operates, uh, gives rise through emergence to uh, things like time. And then that then leads to um, um, mathematical um, axioms, right? So he doesn't even have um the foundational axioms of mathematics so it's pre-math and then he has a choice in what math he has because what he's dealing with is meta mathematics where it's it's infinite 
therefore it can be in any configuration right so the requirement for your axioms of mathematics would be self-consistency you can't create a set of axioms that are in contradiction so that would be the only rule and then how you go about setting up your set theory where you have like the mellow frankel set theory which allows a universal set or russell's set theory which doesn't allow for a universal set it's up to you what you adopt right and there might be all manner of different set theories right and you could probably get an agi to go off and say just chew over you know metamathematics and keep coming up with different forms of metamathematics in a simulator right as an exercise see if it comes up with anything interesting but the thing is is that you have it with the wolfram project and they then go off and they say good we have recovered the mathematics that we traditionally use in our civilization and then they go off and if i've understood correctly and i don't follow that project as much as i follow um geometry and unity but i have watched some of his live streams i do think his talks on the history of science are very good so i recommend those and wolfram will go and then say right we've got the mathematics now we can use that mathematics in a higher order way in order to specify physics and this physics will be all manner of things will pop out of this thing and it's not like you've got direct control of what it will give him he like plays around with it gives it a chance to generate some of these simulated universes that aren't um four-dimensional universes they are simpler than that and these toy universes will have these properties that will be similar to our physical universe and i think he's using toy universes because it's like just an easier way of um making progress you don't have to wrangle with all those dimensions and presumably he thinks that once he's got where he's going he can then um set it up to being four dimensions um or he's going to let it self-assemble into whatever number of dimensions it needs to be and it might be that at four dimensions something happens or it might be that um in the lorentzian uh, metric of one three so it's it wouldn't if it was two two that'd be no good if it was four zero or zero four it'd be no good because you in in zero four you have four dimensions of space but zero dimensions of uh time so there's you have no dynamics you have no lagrangian because um there's no time in which anything you know that has potential energy can become kinetic energy uh if you then say well, well let's swap it around let's have four dimensions of uh time and zero dimensions of space well you've got all the time to do all the things you want with but you don't have any way for it to happen right so for that reason that's a fail so eric goes through this and kind of discusses these other sectors as um other parallel universes to our own which exist and ours is the only one that's sensible so ours which is x uh one three is the one that is the one that makes sense um anyway the thing about the what i was saying about the religion thing is that um when you're ill um the the, the your things you know you are crazy right and the things that you say your your brain will uh, find meaning in things where there's none there that's that's as simple as i can make it that's what madness is and um you'll find that you're you're not immediately cottoning on to the fact that you will so it's a gradual process so like it happens over the course of a month and you get more and more obsessed with things and you don't see it coming and then you are um it, into bad habits and you know you can be paranoid and it's not healthy right 
So I have never had it be that I've become ill and I've gone, oh, I'm ill. I must do something to remedy this, you know, like call the doctor or something. It's never happened because it's like boiling a frog. The frog doesn't jump out of the, I mean, I should think it would, but you know the analogy. It, you don't jump out of the, the water as it raises in temperature because you're acclimated to the changes at every point. And how mad you were yesterday compared to how you are today, it's not really that different. Right, so you can compare this to how people are politically, and this is going to sound controversial, but I'm going to do it both sides, right? So in America, they've got people who vote for the Blue Party and people who vote for the Red Party, right? And the people who vote for the Blue Party hate the people in the Red Party, and the people in the Red Party hate the people in the Blue Party. And yet they're all Americans, and they're all patriots, right? So that's that is a insane situation and it never used to be quite this bad as it's now is it's it's got incredibly toxic and um it's quite worrying that that things have got that divided um and both sides are sort of insane and they're insane they're insane about the other side they think the other side is the devil and um that that's that's a real problem because they're at an impasse in terms of communication and uh, reconciliation and um that's a, that's a huge problem and I don't really see a way around it other than one side is uh, defeated in an election, in an election which they accept because they say, okay, that was a constitutional election. And we feel that it was, maybe there was some shenanigans, but it wasn't enough to really make a difference. And it was fair enough, right? We feel it was fair enough. And the result may not have been the result we hoped for, but it wasn't like there wasn't even an election, right? Okay, so in 2020, there wasn't an election. Joe Biden isn't president. Donald Trump isn't president. No one is president. And so that's a controversial thing to say on YouTube. But it's true, it's fact, because the swing states in certain areas were like saying, we're going to change the way we're going to do voting, we're going to do mail out ballots. And they needed to pass laws to change the way they did the votes. Had they done that, had they gone through the state legislatures and changed the way they do the votes, it would have all have been constitutional and no one could complain. Right? No one could complain. But as it was, there were Republicans in control of the state legislatures and they thought we've tried taking the laws through there, they'll get shot down by the Republicans who won't want to move to a system that will favour people who have been scared into their houses so that they, you know, the, the, the lockdowns go on longer. And then when it comes to voting date, Biden would really, really suffer if people were, no, I'm not going out to vote. It's not worth it. I might catch something. So they had to make it so they could do man in ballots. But if they can't pass the legislation to do it so it's legal, then when they conduct the election whilst ha having the man in ballots, it doesn't matter how many votes they get. It's an unconstitutional state election. And you only have to have one state out of the whole federal state for it to then invalidate the whole of the 2020 presidential election. So it isn't that Donald Trump won. It's not really that they it was stolen. 
or rigged. It was that it didn't happen. And I don't see anyone else saying this. I think this is a very original uh, view of the situation. And I think that it's in 2024, they need to make it so that um, if they do change um, to do mass mail out ballots for, for whatever reason or any other things like, you know, having it so that you need voter ID or not have voter ID or however it is that it's done, um, that all needs to be sorted out well in advance of the election in a way that is constitutional. Because if it gets to a result and say the Democrats win, they only win if the Republicans accept the win. And the Republicans are likely to accept the win if they believe that it is a constitutional election this time around, unlike it was in 2020. So that would be my advice to the Democrats, would be to say, do it above board in terms of the actual constitutionality of the election. If you're going to be messing around trying to arrest Trump and put him in prison, you can go ahead, play those games, but don't make it so that there is um, no legitimacy to the actual event of the election. Undermining that means that people just won't respect the result. That it, it boils down to something as simple as that. People not respecting the result. If you have a vote and then it was within a, uh, a voting event that was unconstitutional, then the government that is elected through that process is itself unconstitutional. So the current administration of the United States is illegitimate and unconstitutional. And it's, that's before you get into like corruption, right? and allegations of corruption, which seem to be substantive, right? So put all of that aside, and it's like, it's way simpler than that. You can go an Occam's razor on the whole thing, and you can say, no one is president. And that is absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, America is, I think America should be a laughing stock of the whole world, that they make out their great democracy well, a, a constitutional republic, and in the name constitutional republic is the word constitution, and yet they're not, because they can't even elect a president according to the constitution. They don't follow it. They don't recognize it. It's toilet paper to them, all right? So um, if they're so confident that they can win, and it's not like, the US economy is in a terrible way. It's bad for people who are poor, but it's not bad for everyone. So Biden could get in, but they need to cool it off on all of the uh, stuff where they do things that make the, the, the election illegitimate. And um, if they do it two times in a row, and they mess people around, it could be really serious. Really, really, it could be catastrophic. It could lead to civil war. So there was talk of civil war in 2020, well, 2021, and it was uh, quelled. But four years later, after the consequences of a Biden administration being so hard on the people who were the ones that were voting for Trump, they're the ones who have suffered under Bidenomics. There could be blood over the whole thing if it happens again. And they're talking about there being another virus, um, which is called X. So they've got a name for it. They're talking about it. Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab were talking about this virus X at the World Economic Forum. You need to look that up. So it's like, are they going to try and 
have lockdowns again and justify having mail out ballots in um, November of this year. I mean, they might. Are people going to fall for it again? Are people going to comply with the lockdown the second time around? Because it could be that the lockdowns are actually necessary because whatever virus X is, is more virulent and more fatal than COVID was. Right? So you just don't know. So <coughs> let's um, sit, read the chat. Um, I know you don't have a choice. So the thing about me and God is that the concept of God is that if I have this religious mania, let's see if I can explain it. If I believed in God, I would be... I have a harder time stopping myself from tending towards religious mania because I'd be living within a kind of low-grade religious mania anyway. I used to know a woman, I've moved away from the area now, and she believed in angels. She'd seen them. She was very religious. And I thought, okay, so you've kind of got low-grade religious mania. And I thought that was quite interesting didn't affect her in the rest of her life. She was not, like, mad, right? But I thought, this is what it is. This is what um, strong faith is like to the point where you hallucinate um, angels. And um, someone might say, but no, she saw them, and angels are real, and I see them too. And so that's a difference of... uh, worldview between someone who has faith and what they perceive they put through the lens of their faith and I don't want to take that away from them if they feel that they had a religious experience that was you know deeply meaningful to them that would be rude and I'm big on etiquette so I'm just talking about it in terms of me and my personal lived experience that um if I saw an angel, I would be going, oh, I'm hallucinating, right? Now, I have hallucinated. I haven't done it much. And surprisingly, I haven't done it more. Um, I hallucinated the universe. So there was a thing that was this size. There's like a little thing, like a sculpture that had a space inside of it. And I looked and there was a whole universe inside. And I could, I was like God looking at the universe from outside the universe. And it was kind of like a milky, uh, light gray um, thing. Of, and it's too small to see stars. Um, you know, it's kind of like the, the near superclusters and things like that. But you zoom out all the way to the point where you get the entire thing. And I was like, it was not no color that I could discern because it was it is mainly like white but it's kind of faded out into a kind of almost like a kind of cobweb thing and I saw it and I thought what the hell's that and it wasn't immediately obvious what it was so it was interesting because it's like part of my brain was operating in a kind of conscious way in a rational way and it was interrogating what my senses were telling me. And my senses were saying, here's something, what do you think it is? And then I was saying, I don't know. And then my um, my sleeping brain, my unconscious, was making my perceptions think through hallucination, hey, here's something you should be looking at, which wasn't there. And it was making me hallucinate something that my unconscious was suggesting to me to have a look at and so my subconscious wasn't directly speaking to me and I wasn't hearing a voice of saying you know you are God or something like that that hasn't ever happened to me but I was having this visual hallucination which is essentially the same thing where it's putting me in the position of an observer of the universe uh, from an external objective position and because I didn't know what it was to begin with when I first saw it. Um, and then I had to kind of think quite hard to kind of like go, what the hell is that thing? 
um, what's supporting it because it's just floating there, right? Um, I then figured it out what it was and I got scared because I thought, what happens to the universe if that gets knocked over, right? And then the police turned up and they came in the house and I had to try and get myself arrested in another room because I was petrified that they would blunder into it and knock on the floor. And then the all universe, the whole of existence would cease to exist. Right? Because I thought that was the universe that we were in right now. And the universe that we were in, I was seeing that. And it wasn't just like a hologram. Like, here's a hologram of the universe. No, it was the universe. And I, I, I thought I didn't want to risk it. I thought I don't know that it's a universe for reals and it's the one we're in right now or it might be another universe but if it gets knocked over what's the consequence i don't know so let's not knock it over and let's make sure it can't get knocked over yes so that's i was responsible i'm quite a safe person to be nominated to be a uh, god if there was someone to be nominated to be god but i don't think of myself as god um and i haven't um and i i have in the past when i was mad i thought i was myself as a great selector so that's this notion of like there's chaos and you you're the one who says everything here although there's things wrong with it make it be this one so if you've got a multiverse and you're like having a decision about it my way of reconciling the whole thing of a multiverse parallel universes is not to have many many me right and many many you but to have it so that there's only one of all of us and we're all here right and so i'm responsible for picking it with everything that is the matter wrong with it it's my fault okay because i convinced whoever was in power to say okay this one and I had a couple of criteria. I wanted it to be founded on truth, then beauty, and allow for free will. Now, I didn't know how it would be that you'd get free will, how that was affected. Because there's all these people like Dr. Sabina Hossenfelder talking about superdeterminism. And I just do not know. I'm in the same position as Eric Weinstein. I don't know how you have free will, what it means to have free will. Um, I, I don't. I don't know. But I, if if it's the case, I can't change. Like I'm destined to have something happened to me in the future and I can't do anything to avoid it. Um, it's like, what's the point in being alive, right? Everyone's on a track into the future but because everything is a process that's kind of mechanical. And it's like, it's all like clockwork. So, you know, if you say I give up, then they say, oh, well, now you giving up was part of what was the mecha mechanics of the whole thing your reaction to being told about determinism was that you give up and just start smoking pot for the rest of your life, right? And I've never smoked pot, although everything I say sounds like I smoke it a lot. And take shrooms and DMT, all the things I talk about, you'd think I was like the ideal Joe Rogan guest of like someone who'd done mescaline and SD. And I don't need to. I don't need to have done all these things because when I go mad, it's like that times a thousand. Now, I'm not going off into other realms and meeting machine elves. But then, you know, you can say, well, what's this? Right? Is this akin to uh, machine elves? Because, um, you know, I got obsessively interested in geometric unity because of the pandemic and I didn't have anything to do and um, I was really bored and I thought you know what I'm going to um, 
um, you know, find something on YouTube to watch. And I got into watching these long podcasts and I started watching uh, Joe Rogan Experience and then Eric was a guest, I think. I think it was in that order. And then I thought, well, oh, he's got a podcast. I'll watch his podcast. And it was quite highbrow, but I'm quite highbrow. And then I liked it. And I haven't seen every episode. So I'm kind of like rationing myself, funnily enough. I didn't know he was going to stop doing it. But as it is, I haven't watched all the episodes of The Portal, which is an interesting situation, actually. Because it means I've got plenty of them to watch still. And I um, was more interested in the ones he did with physicists. You know, Garrett Lee C and Sawaja Penrose. And... I knew about Garrett Lee's work with the E8 um, exceptionally simple theory of everything, and I had got interested in that theory before I ever heard about geometric unity. And I thought there was something to E8 in a big, weak way. Um, so that was what got me interested in groups, because it is a group and it holds within it the standard model, according to um, the work of Garrett Lisi. So in a way that was a kind of like a, a kind of skeleton key into the mathematics that seems to underlie uh, the symmetries of uh, nature that are represented either through a gate into uh, his theory or through um, uh, E8 cross E8 um, heterotic string theory, right? Um, Eric Weinstein was interested in the Octonians and he was on a um, Dave Rubin podcast and he was talking about Octonians there. Um, uh, a woman by the name of uh, Cole Fury um, has found a way of recovering the standard model from uh, the division algebras, which is the reals and the complex and the quaternions and the octonions. And she puts them together in various different combinations and she ends up kind of recovering the uh, standard model. And I find that impressive. Um, and I quite like the way of like smuggling in extra dimensions into a four dimensional manifold or into um x13 Lorentzian space time by saying well let's have it be that the extra dimensions are um imaginary right so they're all constructed around um the square root of minus one and so in a sense you are um in a sense you have something where it is you're going in to some structure like a spinner uh, within the manifold and it's involving complex numbers and that involves the imaginary unit and then you're I'm thinking well is this like Alice in Wonderland right where she she's like laying in the field and bored with the book she's reading sees a white rabbit and the white rabbit goes down the uh, rabbit hole and then she's pursuing the right the white rabbit and she ends up in Wonderland and I think that's an interesting uh, point of a analogy uh, with quantum field theory and the bizarreness of it. And um, the other book, um, Through the Looking Glass, is very like um, P symmetry. And so the um, thing I was talking about with that, I don't know if this is all over the place, but the thing is, is that I think I need to I need to get back to reading the comments. Um, do you believe that sentience is right? But the, the thing about me and God is that I can't risk believing in God because I feel it's going to make it me not apprehend me going ill because of the religious mania. I'll just accept that it's normal, right? 
So it's all, all right for people who aren't going to be hypermanic to mess around at the fringes of a feverish, um, heightened sense of religiosity. But for me, it doesn't suit me at all. And I, it's like a drug. And, I, and, I, I, and it's like I, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm an alcoholic for religion. And so I have to kind of completely go dry on it. So um, I can't be around it. And um, I don't know much about it. And yet I get religious, right, when I'm ill. And what happens is I synthesize my own religion. I invent my own religion. So because I don't know enough about religion, to do it in a conventional way and say, right, I'm Jesus, which is a usual thing when people are ill, they say, I'm Jesus. That's never happened to me. I think of all manner of other things, and it can be as complicated as you like, and as elaborate as you like, and it usually in involves, you know, a mixture of narcissism and feeling that, well, somebody has to create the universe. Um, because otherwise it won't exist. So I better do it just in case it needs creating. And then it changes a bit to, uh, well, maybe it doesn't need creating, but it needs selecting out of a multitude of alternatives and then say this one. And that's roughly where I was with the last time I was ill. So in a way it's kind of got a bit more like I'm getting better because I'm going from like thinking I'm God to thinking I am um, like the kind of like God's right hand man or something. I'm not the one that's making everything. I'm just the one that's saying this will do. And it is imperfect because the whole point of picking a world that is imperfect and committing to this with all the problems it has, being the one that gets made, when you could say, no, let's leave this one just being mathematics, is to say that um, I want it to have free will. And the, the bargain of having free will is that it's so important philosophically and existentially to have free will, that to not have free will is just out of, you can't contemplate living without it right it will make your life utterly meaningless so if you have to have it what's the consequence what's the cost and the cost is that other people with free will will be doing horrible things and they'll be raping and murdering and you know putting babies in ovens in gaza and things like that so that that happens and it's not very nice and but that's their free will and their right to choose to do that way. And that's, I mean, I didn't know any of that was what I was going to open up specifically. Didn't, couldn't foresee it, but I knew about, you know, the Nazi Holocaust and the kind of things they did with fire hoses and teenage girls and things like that. And I just thought, what would cross anyone's mind to even think to do that? And... But then, like, what would give them the freedom of will to be able to do that? And I, I, I was uh, mystified. But then I realized in saying there should be free will, that it entails both people doing good things and people doing extremely horrible things to each other. And technically, I don't believe in good and evil. But in ordinary frame of reference conversations, I do understand what people mean when they talk about good and evil. Um, and if they say some act or some person is evil, that either their actions were evil or they themselves are evil or irredeemably evil, uh, I, I just like, you know, sure, you say that, I, I understand what you think you mean by that. And in my worldview, I don't think in terms of evil 
but I know you think of this person as a very bad person sort of thing, right? So um, I don't try educating people out of them saying, you know, evil or sin or, or these concepts that people have. They are, uh, it's a, there's a cultural mismatch between me and 90% of everyone on the planet, more than 90%. So I am in the minority of people who don't believe in God and I am a devout atheist. I'm not just like an agnostic. I can't believe in God and I am anti-theist in the sense that I'm not against other people having their beliefs in God, but I can't have a God in my uh, worldview. Anyway, that's my full answer on that. Um, do you believe that sentience is fundamental or matter? I think matter is, and I think sentience is emergent from matter. Um, and I know that you've got your thing. I'm not all that familiar with your theory. Um, so forgive me on that. I've been fully focused on Eric's and I haven't been focused on Stevens and I haven't been focused on yours. So apologies there. Um, and um, so, yes, the, the, the notion of if you're suggesting, and I'm just saying this because I am guessing at what your, your theory is, is that you think that there's thought and then that gives rise to things. Is that right? So um, that's a perfectly legitimate way of operating. Um, you, you can take it another direction. You can say, uh, because the model of physics can be described in terms of mathematics, then th that mathematics can be described computationally with a graph, and then that could be described in terms of whatever else would be in the universe of discourse that would give rise to any form of thought, um, but not there's a being out there thinking it, but just the ideas uh, that could be thought of uh, have a form that can be described uh, semantically and syntactically, right? And that space, which is beyond just a given language, so you're not stuck in a language to have, that limits what you can think. It would be a language which, or languages that will, like an infinity of languages that would allow you to be able to have within that infinite domain of discourse every thought that could possibly be had, most the majority of which would be complete nonsense, waste of time, dead ends, right? And then tiny, tiny, tiny amount of that would be something that you say, right, axiomatic foundations for mathematics that is what you need to construct physics as we know it, and you lead that to a... Um, you know, a Everest Galois, and then you have your um, Emmy Nerta, and then you have your, um, based off the work of Cedric Lee, and then you have your, uh, everything coming out of that, and you end up with your U6464, and then all of this of the, um, you know, uh, that will create the uh, gauge group G and then the gauge group G, which have changed in this notation from when it was uh, H, you go down the arrow and the that's now what the principal fiber bundle um, is. And um, then that gets put into the chimeric fiber bundle. So in terms of his diagram, he has the spinners, which are in terms of U6464 uh, operating um, on the chimeric fiber bundle. And they're not operating on Y. The chimeric fiber bundle is over Y, right? So Y isn't the end of the story. Um, 
and why is included within the chimeric fiber bundle. So the chimeric fiber bundle is has contained within it why. So you have a 14-dimensional space that is distinguished into time and space dimensions, seven temporal dimensions, seven spatial dimensions. And then that is put into the thing where it's got all this extra stuff tacked onto it which is going to make it be amenable to allow you to take a section of that fiber bundle and then from that pull out um, a Lorentzian uh, one three space time and so you start off with the gauge group here and then miraculously that gives you space time with the the metric right the metric which is this thing that allows you to measure things it is like time comes into being from the metric which is this, the um the unrestricted set of dimensional measures uh, needed to chart the surface of x4 and um you know, if, you, if you're going up from X4, it's like, okay, you're going to need Y14. But that's just to construct the next thing, which is, um, you know, the spin group. So if you go all the way over here, you find out that if you put everything together, you end up with um, constructing the um, standard model and it's included within the largest version of the group, which is U128 um, double strut C, black ball, ball, black ball bold C. And that is the, the direct spinners. And then you go through a process of what's called decomposition, and you split the 128 to, into 64, 64, and that's wild spinners. And that means you're no longer dealing with an infinite set because the set of complex numbers is infinite and having a finite set is what you want. And that will mean that it, it can, I think, be quantized. So if it stayed as U128 double strut C, I don't think you could quantize it, but because it gets back to being something sane, um, that's all right and that's, uh, it's large, it's like really, really big, but it um, has within it um, a P symmetry. So this symmetry over here um, that was controversial, which I might have had talked about before, and it was found, uh, it was proposed by Zhang Dali, uh, written vertically, and... Um, um, Chen Xiang, no, sorry, uh, Chen Ying Yang, right? So those two uh, proposed it, and then um, Xiang Xiang Wu, a uh, female experimenter, confirmed that this was the case and that we had um, this property whereby. Uh, when in the group SU2, which is governing the weak interaction, we have some things that turn to the to the uh, right and some things that turn to the left. And you'd expect it in the case of a P symmetry mirror universe to be the same. So if I have it like this, or if I have it like this, it should be equal amounts 50-50 both ways if I if everything gets reflected. And that's what P symmetry means. A mirror universe should operate the same way as the right way around. And it was found in this experiment where they put a magnetic field on the decay um, radiation of uh, neutrons or something. It went off and it gave a 60-40 split. And things were mainly going left, which means that the universe is sinister. Because if you've got something that's you're left-handed, it's, uh, it's called sinister. That's where sinister comes from.
Now, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who was sold on the whole idea of everything being symmetrical because of the work of Emmy Nertha and her conservation laws being based on everything in Everett Galois symmetries, it's like, yeah, it's all going to be uh, symmetrical. He wasn't happy. And he said, I want to have the experiment done again. Uh, I don't accept that it's uh, breaking this P symmetry. And um, he was friends with uh, the lady who, who did it, um, but he, he still couldn't accept it. And so um, Pauli was like, got to do it again. And it was done again. It was done independently. I think on different equipment and same result. So it's a property of our universe. Now, thing is, a property of our universe. What if there's more than just our universe? So in um, geometric unity, you have our universe, which is this blue thing here, right? And it's a four dimensional pseudo Romanian manifold. And it's characterized by X, where X is given this Lorentzian uh, split signature metric of one dimension of time and three dimensions of space. So that's what X refers to in the lecture. And then when you go off and say, can we grow um, um, the unrestricted set of dimensional measures from this, which I have over here as YM, where M is the um, unstricted set of dimensional measures for um, a space D, there's mathematical formula you can use to calculate that. I've also covered it in my last video, how you do it. And it turns out that the maximum set of dimensional measures, the unrestricted set is 14. And that's more than what Einstein had. Einstein only had 10. And that gives you a bit more headroom for constructing a, a quantum field theory. And that leads through more math to the construction of this group U6464, and it's all determined mathematically, and I won't go into how, because I've covered it in the last video. And um, all the math works out. It all checks out fine. and. He's not making any mistakes whatsoever in how he does it. I've looked in books about how all of this is done and the way he's constructing all of this is perfectly legitimate. Now, um, he has this and the only bit that is like, well, we don't know and I can't say whether or not it works is whether in having this chimeric five bundle C on this thing, whether he can use it in the way he proposes and get it so that he can pull back to there and then pull back to there and have some of the content from the 14 dimensional space uh, in the four dimensional space because he has to sort of he can't fit all of it in right because he's got 14 dimensions of stuff and it won't all fit into four dimensions so there's a whole lot of other stuff that's in this 14-dimensional um, Osmanian manifold that you don't get to see. And he, he, he predicts in his paper what that stuff is. And then it goes through this process of um, pullback, which is this arrow here. And it's done in a kind of question and answer. So you kind of like ask the question, you know, what have you got for me or what have you done for me lately? You know, like Whitney Houston. And then that would be on the left. That would be the eyeball that would be doing the observation. And the mechanism for observation um, is gravity. So that's written upside down. And it says here, um, we just look on this side of the diagram. The bottom part of the diagram there is our space time. I could zoom out a bit more. There you go. X13 is our space time. We are in that space time, but the eyeball doesn't literally mean us. It means gravity. 
And that's something that confused me to begin with, because I thought it meant us looking at the universe. And historically, this diagram that isn't his was meant to mean that. So that was super confusing. Uh, so it's got nothing to do with John Archibald Wheeler's participatory anthropic principle. Nothing, right? So this is misleading. And it's to do with taking this idea and this diagram, which has different semantic connotations, and then saying, I'm going to overload it rather than come up with a totally different diagram. And then say, oh, I want to have this thing doing an observation and I have the observation being represented by the Hebrew symbol Gimel, when you could just write in the word gravity, right? So he says in, I think, section 12 of his summary, um, it's section 12, the summary, he says, gravity is the engine of observation. Or it's somewhere around there in the paper. So, in fact, I could look that up now because it would help if I did that because it is... We do that and we type that in. Um, it should be there. Twenty seven matches, this is gonna take forever. So everything is to do with um so it's it, obviously it's a concept that is um integral to this. Um uh, right, metric data transfer under pullback operation is the engine of observation. So that's a fancier way of saying the same thing as gravity is the engine of observation. Um, now, does he actually say it um, in words? Uh, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. So this is a diagram here. That is that diagram there. Do you see? That's where it is appearing in the text of the paper. It's got a few more governs over here. Um, and it's a bit confusing because he's saying that's the observers and that's the stuff that comes out as being uh, being observed. And there's stuff that's being observed in X that's over here. And there's a stuff that's being observed on Y that's over there. So um, I suppose in a way, me writing this is kind of wrong because I've said Y is the observed and there are things that are in X that are also observed. So yeah, that there's a correction I should make there. The, there's things being observed in X because there's fields that are um, invasive a standard model. That's what SM stands for. Invasive standard model fields on X and then the native uh, geometric unity field on X. So um, we see a portion, a partial sample of the 14 dimensional uh, Erismanian manifold um, behavior, right? And the rest of it is up living on that surface, right? And it's very, very pure. It's just omega on Y, right? It's omega and y, and if you go there, you can see here how simple it is. It's the observed is y, 77 is, um, just has omega there. So, I mean, I have probably oversimplified that. And so, you know, I should have made it so that there's some kind of self-regard um, of things with the i, where it's like, it's got stuff it observes in x13 and it'll be the standard model fields and it'll be um the what was it that's saying the native um geometric unity field which is um uh that lives on x and that will be this and that gimel is uh gravity 
Now, does it say anything in the um, summary? Because I thought, I'm sure it says it in the paper somewhere um, about uh, gravity as the engine of observation. There. It said 27 of 27 matches, and then it didn't take me to the last match. So section um, six, um, there, that's it. That's what I wanted. So gravity is the engine of observation, so that where gravity is localized in different sections, and a section is like you have a tower that is your fire bundle, and you're taking a slice through that tower and you're saying i want that to be my um universe so you've got this observers and you're observing the universe and you're taking the universe out of that and you're observing it with gravity which exists within the thing that you have brought out of it and you're thinking well how can you bring out of something that needs to have a space-time metric to do the gravity how can you have the thing that needs that it's like a paradox of like which comes first chicken or the egg right you've got the 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 pseudo they've got the semi romanian or pseudo romanian manifold x13 but how do you get to that this is where he's trying to get into the area of it being a theory of everything he's trying to get it so he can arrive at that from something more primitive and he's trying to recover space time so it, he's making it super duper hard for himself because he's, he's it used 64 64 in a grand unified theory that you could like publish that and just go home there's like no i'm not done and i i'm now want to be able to bridge two generally thought to be completely incompatible geometries i'm going to take the arismanian uh, geometry of quantum field theory and the uh, Riemannian geometry of general relativity, which don't have anything to do with each other, right? That's they've been like at loggerheads for 100 years, and he's now going to create this chimeric fiber bundle so that the thing will play nice. And he has what I've written down here as this chimera. Roman mythic beast with a head of a lion and tail of a snake. And I'm saying he's trying to get from Y down to X by some means. Um, he's using this chimera in between. But it's not just there for a pictorial sake. That is, I'm saying that is the chimera that is the thing he's created to do the job of getting from one to the other. So rather than write what he has here on the screen, which is like this, all of that there is what that picture of that lion snake thing is, right? So the head of the lion is here and you have that be the unitary group 6464 64 wild spinners and that's is the gauge group and then the gauge group is part of the principal fiber bundle which is uh inside of the chimeric fiber bundle so it's inside of it right so the principal fiber bundle is just a note on what that means is that let's say you had wolfgang Pauli's uh notion of a um how do you create a fiber bundle you say you take a ring and you take a tangent to the ring like that like that and you have all of these things that are straight lines that are tangents to the circle right but forget about the cup it's just a convenient thing for me to have a circle right now on the on the screen there i have an example of something that's called s1 and S1 represents a circle. Now, I've embedded the circle, the black ring, inside of a plane. And that whole plane is flat, man. So imagine a sheet of paper 
and you go off and draw a circle on it and that is uh, a one-dimensional thing the plane that it's in is two dimensions so it's embedded in this larger space but the ant that goes and walks around the ring is only aware of it living in one dimension it can only stay on the ring right so the space it's in the ambient space it's in is kind of like a convenience for us to talk about it and in the same sense as this has a circle here right but obviously it's a three-dimensional cup right so you might say well that surface there is two dimensions you saying yes it is but then you say what's happening along this and it's like a loop and it's one dimensions so like a line would be you know one dimensions and then a line that goes around back to itself where all you are is you are aware of going along the line you're in the line going along the line you can't be outside of the line looking down on the line saying oh it goes around in a loop you don't get to see that it's a bit like you've got a model train set and they has a track going around in a loop but you're you're miniaturized you're inside one of the train carriages and you're going along in the train carriage and you can't see out the windows because the blinds are drawn and it's like your existence is you can get up you can walk along the length of the train and back down to your seat but you can't look out the window you can't get the impression that you're going around in a circle going nowhere that's what it's like in this world of line land right so you have that you go off and you create a tangent to this and the tangent will be at the middle point of this thing that's red i haven't got a red though and you put that on and you put it on at every point around this infinitesimally close and you do that and then you do something crazy because you go off and you do like that and you turn it vertically right and so the first operation you do is called taking a tangent and that is where you get the red t that's there in front of the s one and the one means it's one dimensions and then you go off and you tilt this space so if i had it directly to camera the t would come out but the that surface there you go off and show it at a angle like that and you imagine that's inside of some kind of cardboard cutout so we can get a sense of where it is and it's got like a round hole in it in the middle right you then have this and i'm doing something a little bit unusual because i'm thinking okay if you've got the cutout in order to show the hole rather than putting the tangents to the space where they're around the outside for the sake of this illustration to just sell it a bit more i'm going to have them on the inside of the rim which might not be legitimate i don't care and i'm going to have it turn so they go like that and so they're all going to be arrayed around the inside of the cup like pencils like a cup full of pencils but it's not taking up the volume of the inside of the disc they only know to rest against the edge and they're perpendicular to the inside right so they're all standing up like this and you've got lots and lots of these pencils and each of these pencils these red lines is a fiber and the whole set that i've drawn going vertically there is a fiber bundle and this is gauge theory 101 and the way I like to think about this is if you lived in line land, what this fiber bundle is, is at right angles to your reality. So I've distilled a concept into a semantic abstraction where I can now say in our reality, what kind of thing would it be for us to have a fiber bundle? to our four dimensional space time and it'd be like i couldn't possibly conceive of it it's like okay we'll, we'll be complicated 
it would be something you wouldn't be able to imagine. But you can imagine right angles to reality. Right? Because you can imagine something that's at right angles. You can have something like this and it has something that goes at an angle to it where this here has nothing to do with this. Right? So it's like an escape. Right? And so this is the escape from reality. And so this is what the fiber bundle gets you. And it has to be an escape because it has to be that what's happening in these fibers, it has nothing to do with what's happening in the other space. It has to be disconnected. You have to geometrically make it so that it is um, immune. It, one isn't affecting the other. Now, eventually you make it so that it does have an effect through various means. But you want to make it so that mathematically it is kind of decoupled, but it has this association to it knew, knew where it got its uh, information from. Okay? So these things are going through that hole, and they're like that. The point at which they make contact, which would let's say it's just in the midpoint for simplicity, that midpoint of all of those fibers, you take the fibers away and you look at the midpoints, it's like you've got a tiny piece of the puzzle of how you made that ring, but they're inside of this longer thing. And then what you have is you have the ability to be at different positions on the fiber, and that can give you different rings. So you have a whole succession of rings that goes up and forms like a, I mean, Eric uses the example of a, a toilet paper core in one of his talks. And that's where this is coming in from. This is why he does that. And his hair tie, he has an example on um, the Theory of Everything at YouTube panel is snapped and kind of it's like an elastic hair tie, and it goes around the toilet paper core. So he is assuming that there are lines running up the um, outside of the um, toilet paper car. I don't know why he didn't draw lines on, you know, with the felt tip pen, and just draw lines all the way around it. It would have helped. But... Um, that's what he had there. So that's what he was fooling around with, with that. And he was trying to do a very low dimensional um, version of what he then elaborates into uh, needing for his geometric unity theory, um, which technically isn't a theory, right? It's a collection of ideas. And um, I've said in other streams, um, it, you know, it's not a theory of everything. It's not um, a theory. It's not quantized. Um, it's um, it's not a hypothesis. It's not a model. Um, it's not a well-defined... Um, um, instantiation. It's not, a, it's not a single instantiation of a well-defined idea. It's a speculative exploration, a spectra, it's a speculative exploratory program of a collection of ideas where he's open to pursuing multiple instantiations um, as he pursues this um, uh, goal of unification. So it doesn't really matter how he goes about it, right? The end goal of unification is what he's looking for. So he is overall looking to do, take the geometry of Charles Oesman and the geometry of Bernard Riemann, which are usually thought to be incompatible, and make it so there's something that bridges them. And the way he bridges them is he puts um, C around the, the Y. And then you say, well, what's he do with the X? And the thing is, is the X lives inside of the Y. Okay? The X is four dimensions. The Y is 14. 
that 14 includes the 4. And then the C is adding extra spaces to help him get from uh, the 14 space down to not just a four space embedded within that as a slice, as a section, but as um, is, is, is recovering it with a metric. So let's show how that works. So you start off with this, with the Ovismanian manifold, which is described according to this group, G equals uh, the unit group of six, U64, 64 ball spinners. That is the principal fiber bundle. The fiber bundle looks like this, except it's much more complicated than that because it's not based around U1. It's based around U6464. So it's way, 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 way more complicated, right? And that then is made more complicated still by being put inside of the chimeric fiber bundle. The Kyomet bundle here has this thing here, which has got this thing on it as the spinners. It puts that inside of uh, the Kyomet fiber bundle. So the Kyomet fiber bundle is like devouring Y. So we look over here, and this is eating this, right? And it's going into the belly of the beast and something is going to be happening in here and then it comes out the other end and then you have this. But technically speaking, X is part of the chimera. It doesn't really get away from being part of the chimera. Um, and neither does that. They're both trapped within it. So I know I've drawn them outside of it, but... I, I just did that so I had a nice black background for my lettering of the names of the people responsible for the geometries, for the top top space and the bottom space. So then you have this thing where you have um, the Kyrok uh, five bundle of Y77 um, is bought, uh, is this. It is the H13 asterisk uh, by um, uh, cross um, V64. Now you might look at that and say, I don't know what you're telling me. Well, if you go and you do um, one, three, and then you say uh, six, four, and you add them together, you add the corresponding numbers we have one and six. So we go one plus six and three plus four. And that's going to get you seven and seven. So that's how you have that. And if you add seven and seven, obviously that comes to 14, right? So what he's done is he's made it a simple um symmetrical um uh, signature for that and that i think is a good idea because you don't want to make it something else like nine five or five nine because then it begs the question like why is it one rather than the other and so it won't be as a fundamental a theory if you have a question that remains that you haven't accounted for an answer but when it's seven seven the flip of that um, it's still 7, 7. So you don't have to then say, well, we have a parameter for why it is the way around it is, because it doesn't matter which way around it is. Okay? So that makes it closer to being a theory of everything by picking that instantiation over 5, 9, or 9, 5. Now, that, you can say, in a way, that it, it is these two spaces. And... Uh, there's a vertical one and there's a horizontal one. Now, the vertical one, V, is this one, this yellow, kind of piss yellow thing. And inside of that is included this. Now, this is just an analogy to how complex this is because it would be 
um, V would have to have many more things. It would have, I'm thinking it probably would have um, at, at least 10 um, dimensions and it's split into six and four. And um, this here, this S1, um, that would be that circle. And then you could have something where you say an S2 here would be uh, the surface of a ball. And then you could put dots all over the surface of the ball and then take, you know, tangents off that surface and think, yeah, I've done the whole job. I have done effectively their right angles to that surface of the ball because any ant that's living on that ball, it can go, you know, longitudinally or latitudinally around that surface. It's to it, it seems like it's trapped within a two dimensional surface, but it can't get off the surface, right? It has no concept of height. And the thing that has concept of height is the fibers. So if I was trapped within the surface of the earth, then a fiber that went up like that, off, off to infinity for me, uh, would be, um, you know, perpendicular to me. It, it would go, th the thing is, is I feel it would need to go to the center of the earth as well. And there's no well-defined thing for what happens when they all converge at a point. And I think they are uh, parallel to each other. So for them to be parallel to each other, I'm thinking, oh, I've misunderstood. It's not like it's a hairy ball. It's actually that they are, again, at right angles to reality. So imagine that the ball in th three dimensions, you might think, will use the third dimension to have things stick out of it like a porcupine. That's wrong. What you need to do is you need to go into the fourth dimension or the fifth dimension to be able to do it. I mean, it's in it's in space time, so you probably do need to go into the fifth dimension at least, right? So um, that's how you do it when you have a ball in um, ordinary space time and you're trying to go off and uh, have some way of uh, constructing a fiber bundle of the points of that ball. And that's only in the case of S2. And you can have more complicated balls than that. So you can have an SN, where N can be any number you like. It could be one, two, 100, you know, and that will be a hypersphere. And I can't draw that. Right, but the people who uh, come up with the animations of hot vibration uh, try and draw that. So there's an animation of the hot vibration that is. Um, Right. Um, I literally spoke about this in my live stream tonight. Um, who do you think would have been observing you and then changing the universe for you? How's that not gone? I thought it was um, aliens. And I was... That's why I was doing the thing with the UAP, changing the laws of physics so that the UAPs could come through. I thought they were stuck in another dimension where they can show up, they, 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 they're, they're seen, but they're not actually materially here because they're like on a different wavelength of matter or something. And they're, they're like polarized light. And so I thought, well, I need to make it so that they can rotate their themselves into phase with our reality so they're not just um something that we can look at but there's something that we can touch now me making this change 
doesn't mean that the change then happens after that chronologically, right? Because if you're going to refute me and say, well, people had UFO contacts and had vessels, Lockheed Martin had one from the 1940s onwards or something, you don't understand. Me changing reality by messing around with trees, because that's how I did it, changed the laws of physics at the beginning of our universe, right? So our universe was a was just mathematics. And I made it and I verified it into existence by saying this will be the one out of all the possible ones that are mathematically expressed that becomes a tangible reality that is like physical. And the other ones are just conjecture, right? And they're kind of like Wolfram's toy universes, but they're not necessarily toy, right? And so there's all these things are in mathematics, like this hot vibration. It's just a mathematical construct. It doesn't exist in reality, right? It's not part of Eric Weinstein's theory. It's not at every point in space-time carrying light around. And he likes to make out that it is, but it's not. Um, it, he, his thing is more complicated. The chimeric fiber bundle is related to that shape, but it's a more complicated version of that shape. So anyway, we have that. And so that's the hot fi vibration. And that's how it's written, spelled. And that's all we need to kind of say on that subject. And we go for more detail into um, principal fiber bundles P. We say that P is a principal fiber bundle over the gauge group G, where the gauge group G is U6464. And then you go and put that into C, where C includes that, and it adds a whole lot of extra stuff. And the extra stuff it has is a vertical vector space and a horizontal vector space. And the spaces are such that the horizontal vector space is, if this is a vertical vector space with 64 to it, then the horizontal vector space is hinged up to meet it, right? And that's what the asterisk does. It does a hinging thing. Now, this thing that's vertical is vertical because it's to do the fibers being vertical, right? They're at right angles to reality. So you want to have it so that the thing that's H is also at right angles to reality. And then I think that's how the two things can marry together and get groovy, right? So the multiplication sign, which isn't the multiplication sign, it's a kind of vector space product thing. That thing is getting those two spaces to interact both directions, top down and bottom up, right? And so going from V through to H and going from H up to V, it's going through this thing. And uh, that's getting that to work. And then this, then um, when it's not hinged up, then it's in the same sense as the space it has a point-wise um, connection to, where it's like every point on X will map to a point on H without any difficulty. H is flat, so I've drawn it as this oblong, and then I've got this curved surface here, and this curved surface is space-time with this, uh, it's denoted with X13, uh, which is, of course, the... Lorentzian space-time. Now, when Einstein was working on general relativity, what he would do is he'd have his curved space-time, his pseudo-Romanian manifold, his um, thing which was Hendrik Lorentz um, space-time, and he would go and say, I want to go from here, where the math is really difficult because we're dealing with curves, um, and I want to get away from this curved surface because it's held to calculate with 
and I want to take it from, you know, moving like light going along a geodesic. And I want to go from there and I want to go into somewhere where the calculation is going to be easier. So what he does is he says, I don't mind if this line that is for its, from its perspective in space is going along a straight line. But the space it's in is warped. So from a relativistic observer, it is curved. And I think I've not ruined my credibility by saying that, because I could be wrong. Anyway, so that is your thing going along the line, in a straight line there, as it goes down the slope and back up the slope, right? And then you have this thing where in Einstein, you say you go up this thing called the levi civita connection. And this is just a bit of math that takes you that point at the end there and up to the tail there and then that point at the tip up to there and then all the way along correspondingly will be points along this as it maps from one to the other, right? And it lifts from the curved surface of the manifold up into the flat surface of the vector space and as a result the it's like you're casting a shadow up onto it from a distortion and it might be that it was it was all wonky and curved on below but on the vector space it's like either straight or less wonky or even more well it depends on what the shape is right so I've, I've drawn it like that to just indicate that this arrow seems different from the other arrow but the, the two arrows are the same arrow in a sense mathematically okay and i think this is what's called an isomorphism where um, an isomorphism will be something he'll mention in the le lecture and that is uh, means the same form and it's a from the topic of uh, algebraic topology which is something um, Lex Friedman um, does not need to read books about, okay? Because he's been set up to kind of think, I need to, you know, he asks Eric, what do I need to know to understand all this? And Eric Weinstein was like saying, well, I can recommend a book, and he recommends this book. Okay. So this book, Rachel Penrose, who's got a Nobel Prize in physics, um, it's enormous and it's mainly about um, general relativity. And, you know, what's this? The quantum particle, it does have some stuff on quantum stuff. So, um, yeah, it's supposed to be one book on the topic of everything, right? Um, so that's why it's so big. Um, it's not a book on um, geometric unity. No, no one's done a book on that yet. Uh, in a way, this video serves as like uh, an accessible a video on geometric unity because no one's done one. I mean, there's been like geometric unity in 20 minutes, um, geometric unity in 10 minutes, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I did geometric unity in two minutes. Um, so, uh, but this is going into real depth. So obviously, if you're going to be saying, well, I have questions about this, I have questions about that, what about this, what about that? It's like, well, it's going to take time to explain it all, yeah? And so we're making progress. We're about more than halfway at the moment. So we're here, and we've got Einstein, and he's going up from his um, surface of space-time up into the space, uh, into this horizontal vector space, okay? Now... What Eric Weinstein does, which one of the attendees of his lecture wrote about on Cora and said he was impressed by and he hadn't seen anyone do it before, 
uh, was this thing where you do the reverse. So you do the reverse of the levi civita connection and you start off in the vector space with the energy from this quantum field theory because this is what this is all it's all just energy and it's all a field up here it's an energy field and you bring it through to here and you say i want to go back down the levi civita connection which is just a mathematical mapping of this arrow casting onto a shadow onto a warp surface from a flat flat surface right so it goes from the flat space onto the curved space and it ends up looking curved. And so that gets you to that. And um, anything which has got like a momentum or something um, will end up um, with all of those things being a certain way because of that mapping. And it will uh, go in like that. But not only that, but in this process is where if I understand the theory correctly, this is where it gets time. So, um, I mean, it was getting time at this point, but it actually becomes physical when it's on a manifold that is one which can have space-time. So this is a, a deformable space-time manifold um, where you know you have all the things where you uh, the mass of a planet will make time go slower close to it right and so that will be the end of it that's like you've done it and you've got something through so following it backwards it's like do that do that do that to see and then you could take a shortcut straight into this because that c is all that this is so it's the same thing, right? Just just a quicker way of referencing it. And then you could then say, um, another way of looking at it is to say, what is the purple thing? What's all over the purple thing? Well, the spinners and the spinners are U6464 in terms of being embedded in C. And then you say, okay, what is uh, the spinners? And you say, well, they are on, they're dancing on Y77, and that to me is the observed, although technically uh, X has things that count as the observed too, so I'm corrected on that matter. So I've made an error there, and I should comment about that. X is also um, the observed or um, self observed so um x of um well um x um observes y and x yeah so that sort of, you know, slight, slight kind of, slight correction to diagram. Um, and if we bring this up down here, so we, um, we want to get back to the diagram of the, um, where was it? there then um observation is all the things that are on the right so um i have oversimplified there by saying that it was just y that was observed when it's actually y is observed and x is observed right so all right but this interactive process of me engaging with the material both the 2021 paper and my notes that I form um, as a summary of a summary of a summary. Um, I, I mean, I had all these windows open and I thought, do a screen capture and then go off and then 
um, you've got it all in one, right? And then uh, you're done, right? So, I mean, I could do another screen capture and I could annotate this and I could amend that to I could say there's observed on there as well, but I, I'm, I'm not going to bother because um, I've made a, a verbal note and I've made a, a note in the chat, right? So the whole thing is, is like happening in the chat and it's happening on screen and I'm talking over it at the same time, right? So um, is there much more to say about this? Well, yes. Um, at the top, lurking along here all this time and we will, um, we won't look at that because it's frightful. Um, we have this, I suppose I could do this. Would this help? No, it would not help. I can't drag that window up. Um, I need to have something to cover else. Everything on the screen, what can I have? Um, we could have that, right? Just to kind of stop visual confusion, right? That makes things a bit tidier, doesn't it? So what we do is we look at the top here because you can get overstimulated. We have the Einstein field equations, but in color, right? And they are plural. So it's Einstein field equations, plural in color. Yeah, now what's the purpose of it being in color? Well, if you look to the left, you see what's going on. So if I just take one of these terms, you see this thing is like, these symbols are all the same. It's this symbol is the Greek letter nu full of the Greek letter nu. So it's um, mu, nu. Those are what they are in, in Greek. And what they are, the red one is, the first one on the left, red, is rows. And the second one on the right in blue is columns. I mean, I suppose I could have made it cyan, cyan for columns, but anyway, um, better, better luck next time. So that's all the way through these things are coming in. Now, this is why they're plural, okay? Because these things represent multiple equations. And these things take values between naught and three. So they, each of these takes on values naught, one, two, three. And so in combination, you have a range of things where you could have naught and naught, and then you can have another one, which would be like naught and one and naught and two and, and so on. And then two and two, you know, there are lots of different combinations of these things you could do. So let's go through this table. This table is called a rank two tensor. Okay, it might be unfamiliar to you, that term, but um, we'll be seeing a few tensors in um, this theory, okay, this, this work in progress theory. And what I've done is I've got it so that the um, rows are increasing numbers uh, going down um, and they are, um, the rows are in red. So that's rows there in red. And then the numbers are going 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah. And those are the rows. So the, the number here in 4 uh, is a 4 by 4 matrix. And the first one is it has 1, 2, 3, 4 rows. All right. Now, it's kind of irritating to me that things start off numbered at 0 but that's how it is. And part of the reason is that uh, usually uh, one is used to mean like X and two is used to mean Y and three is used to mean Z. So it's like the three dimensions of space time are there 
and the zero one is used for time, right? Now, you, you have that, and then you say, well, the blue ones will be these blue columns, right? And these ones will mean that the numbers in each column won't change because if this is the zeroth column, they're all going to be zero. And if this one is the second column and it's got a one there because it's numbering zero one, then that's all going to be one, right? So I don't want to belabor this, but the point of me having drawn up like that is that this is trying to cut you through having to learn two years of linear algebra, right? And this is where linear algebra gets complicated and um, it's like the rank two tensor is not like the hardest one, but it it is a hard one, right? Now, if you were saying what would a rank one look like, it would basically just be that, right? It would just be um, a column. And then you say, well, what would it be if it was a rank zero? And a rank zero will shrink the column down to a single value, right? That wouldn't be three naught, it would be naught naught, right? Well, actually it wouldn't be that, it would just, it would just be, um, it would just be a single value, right? So a single value is known as a scalar. So a rank, zero tensor is equal to something that's spin naught in quantum field theory and that is what's called a um, scalar and an example of that would be the Higgs field right so we're looking at Higgs field then we go and we say right we're gonna have the next thing up now Actually, it isn't a rank one, okay, because they go up in halves. So that's because quantum field theory is extremely weird. So we go back down to here and we're going to pretend that we get an extra value that isn't really an extra value because we can only have one value because otherwise it wouldn't be a scalar. It would be like two values and it'd be a table again. So for it to be, to answer the question, how can you have a single number that's two numbers? The way to do that is to have a complex number where you have um, like A plus uh, B I, uh, where uh, I is um, these square root of minus one. All right, so A and A and B are both real numbers, All right? So you've got that. So you've got a definition for uh, the complex numbers. And um, I would like to have the symbol for that. So even though I've got to zoom out and do stuff, I'm going to get that. And we're going to go here and we're going to go. We've got a, an example of a, of a thing here of um, the Einstein field equation is written vertically. That's a, any help to anyone. Like that. So uh, that's the Einstein field equation is vertical. So, um, but I've condensed the terms on the left side of the equation into one tensor, which you can do. Now, um, if you, um, here, yeah, that's where I have my complex number symbol. And I can then go back to list of people and I'll then pop this away. And so we get back to this and we'll put that into the chat.
Okay. So if you see that sign, um, that double strut C, blackboard bold C, that's what that means. And that's what this is. Uh, you see there. So if you have U 128, that is um, the Dirac spinners. And then that is decomposed into U 64, 64 while spinners. Okay. So um, you might say, I don't know what I'm just saying. I'm just saying people's names and their surnames are theirs. Paul Dirac there is responsible for coming up and discovering antimatter. And then we have, um, it might be nice to have a picture of Paul Dirac. Let's get a picture of Paul Dirac because Everyone knows what Einstein looks like, but they don't know what Paul Dirac looks like. So here is Paul Dirac. And there we go, Paul Dirac. Okay. And um, we'll have one for um, Vial. Now Vial is Herman Vial. I can't tell you what he looks like. So let's see what he looks like. So we'll go and ask Wikipedia for his article and um, there. How much later was he? He's born, born 1885 and he was born 1902. So he was born before him. Is that right? Yeah. Interesting. That's, I would have thought it'd be the other way around. So, um, so you get your, your, your complex stuff and then you get your, um, other stuff there that comes out of it. Right now, the, We've got to put it there, I suppose. And drag that around like that. Uh, move that like that. Now, here we have... Um, so we were doing things with tensors, weren't we? And I wanted to say, we've got complex numbers. If you have a complex number and you put it inside of um a thing like that then you're kind of cheating and you're finding your way of having a rank a half tensor where it's like a rank zero but you just find your space between that and the one rank one tensor that would be a column and you're saying we're not going to like multiple entries in the vertical we're still keeping ourselves to one number, but we're going to cheat and we're going to slip in the imaginary um, space into that. So that is going to lead to a spin one half thing in quantum field theory. And an example of something that spin a half would be an electron or a quark. And quarks are what make up neutrons and protons. So they're very important quarks. And then you have their examples of fermions. So they are um, fermions, and we've come across fermions before because we were talking about um, Enrico Fermi. And I'm not going to bring up his picture. So there's that. So we've got that. And then the next thing to do is to say, what's half again onto that? So you go up in halves, and it's now. A half plus a half is one. So a rank um, uh, one tensor is a spin one. So it's all very easy to remember. And the spin one will be uh, an example of that would be a photon um, or a quark. 
no, no, not a quark. I want to talk about a gluon. A gluon is used to glue together quarks inside of an atomic nucleus. And that those are examples of bosons or bosonic fields, and that would be Satyendra Nath Bose. All right, so um, I'm having to do all of this again because the stream, the five hour stream I did where I was doing, did all this, I've lost. So I'm interested in that thing that's red and blue in the corner there, right? So, uh, oh, we needed to have a, a column for that. I nearly forgot. So that would be an example of a rank one tensor, right? Then if you were to then complexify that like you did the last thing, then you'd have um, the um, a rank three over two, and that will be a spin three over two, and that would give rise to um, another matter particle called a uh, Rorita Schwinger matter. And then, um, not that geometric unity has this, um, it doesn't need it, but in theories where there are rank two, so we're going up by half again, it will be um, one, one and a half plus a half is two, spin two is equal to what in string theory would be a graviton and they've yet to find one right and so when you do that and you go out into four by four then that's where they think that would be as a rank two spin two thing now um you'd need a, like a bigger um more elaborate quantum field theory for that um so I, I don't think you could get by with just the standard model as it is. I think it would need to be elaborated further to include something like SU11. Um, so, and then you do the unification of all of that. <clears throat> yeah, and whatever you had, I think, would probably have to be a prime number. Um, so those are the things, and um, that's a, um, a little bit about that, about the quantum field theory aspect of using tensors to define those things. And I might look up Ritter and Schwinger, or Ritter Schwinger matter, just to see if there's anything on that. Oh, I'm typing it on the wrong keyboard. Um, massive spin one three Ritter Schwinger quasi particle in condensed matter systems. So this is a kind of typical example of a paper that's been through peer review. It comes out and it's published on the archive. And this archive is just um, where these things have as a academic um, publishing. Although I think this is like a, a pre-print. It hasn't yet fully been vetted, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, you, you tend to have like an abstract so you don't have to read the whole thing. And it, it summarizes um, like the contents of the paper, but not the conclusions. That's at the end. And then um, 
it will have a number of people working on it and then their sponsors. So it will be a joint collaboration between many different people. So it says here, this was uh, written by Feng Tang, uh, Zilu, uh, Zhang Pengdu, Yu Yu, and Zhang Yang Wan, right? And they're all working at various different places, um, Nanjing University, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, Center for Field Theory and Particle uh, Physics in Shanghai. Um, this is another place of um, Nanjing and you know, seeing it. So they're not slouching off, right? I mean, they're doing some research over there. They're not just copying iPhones. Um, so well done, you know. I mean, I don't, uh, all our uh, universities all gone woke and not doing any real work. Um, so I'll read the abstract. It won't probably make any sense, but I'll just give you a flavor of how these things are written. The spin three over two, which is what we're looking at in the previous example, with the complex in a vector um, known as Loretta Schwinger fermion is described by a vector spinner field. So, you know, I said these things that are in a column of vectors. Well, because it's got the complex element, it's a spinner as well. Um, whose number of components is larger than its independent degrees of freedom. Thus, the Richter Springer equations contain non trivial constraints to eliminate the redundant degrees of freedom. Consequently, the standard procedure adopted in realizing relativistic spin one half quasi particle, which would be a fermion like an electron, is not capable of creating the Ritter Schwinger fermion in condensed matter systems. In this work, we propose a generic method to construct a Hamiltonian which is sort of like a version of a Lagrangian, um, which in, for, the, for describing the dynamics of a system. But I think the Hamiltonian might be for a quantum system rather than the classical system, but I'm not sure. Um, which implicitly contains the Ritter-Schwinger constraints, thus includes the eigenstates and energy dispersions being exactly the same as those of the Ritter Springer equations by implementing our 16 by 16 or 6 by 6 Hamiltonian, we can realize the three dimensional or two dimensional uh, massive uh, Ritter Springer quasi particles, respectively. Um, in the non relativistic limit, the 2D 6 by 6 Hamiltonian can be reduced to two 3 by 3 Hamiltonians. So that would mean that he would, pop, it might be that they're in a table that's like six across by six down, and they're like on the diagonal, they'd be three by three. So they're packed inside of a six by six. So they must have done some cross diagonal cancellations maybe to achieve that if there were terms in the other respects. Um, we describe the positive and negative energy parts respectively due to, so the three and the three are like the positive and the negative things. And then due to the non-trivial constraints, the simplified 2D massive Ritter-Springer quasi-particle. So dealing with toy dimensions, I think, uh, rather than four dimensions, otherwise it'd be intractably difficult because it's now, they've got multiple degrees of freedom because it's a vector spin field. So they're reducing the number of dimensions from four down to two to make life easier for themselves. Um, I should think AI will take over doing all this. You know, the, it, AI won't blink when you say, can you do it, but do it for four dimensions. It'll be like, there, three seconds, and it's, it's written the paper and everything. Um, due to the non-trivial constraints, I mean, what can happen with AI with this? is it might be, we might be two years away from AI just completely running off and solving everything. 
because like we've got all these like loose ends and people are like only able to work on toy theories but they've done lots of groundwork so it learns from that and it goes oh well you're using two dimensions why don't we use four and well it gets asked to use four and it does it in four and it's like great but you could also say could you do it in 14 and it'd do it in 14 no trouble so um I mean, if, if everyone is struggling with the math, I'd just say wait, wait two years, and then all, all, all the software will come available to do it. But he has a position that he doesn't want to tell a computer his theory um, because he thinks it's um, a mistake, you know, for, for the computer to end up learning the theory of everything or a unified field theory. Can, it could like weaponize it or something. And I'm like, okay. But I mean, you put your paper out there for people to read. I'll get it. Paper in China have probably read it. Um, I bet that if Jeffrey Epstein was still alive, he would have read it. He seemed interested and geometric unity you seem to know about geometric unity without you ever having been public about it up, up to that point which must have been very spooky does point to the fact that he was a spy um Ghislaine Maxwell's husband um, sorry Ghislaine Maxwell's father worked for Mossad Soviets, KGB, and uh, MI6 as a triple agent, probably playing three sides against each other. So, you know, and then he commits suicide and like, yeah, right, probably not. Um, it was like, oh, he stole from the pension fund, but like, you're on a boat in international waters, you could just completely fuck off right and never come back so i don't know i don't remember whether they ever found his body or not so uh he might still be alive somewhere um uh our garuda legend stopped by to say hello um so he he won't find this of interest um Where are we this? Um, due to the non-trivial constraint to simplify a 2D massive quasi particle has an exotic property. It has vanishing orbital magnetic moment while its orbital magnetization is finite. Finally, we discuss the material realization of this quasi particle our study provides an opportunity to realize higher spin elementary fermions with constraints in condensed matter systems. Very well. And then it says introduction uh, by requiring the Lorentz invariance, which presumably would be 1,3, that's what they're referring to there, and a positive probability density. Dirac proposed in 1928 a relativistic wave equation, which is Dirac equation describing the electron in one half particles. This equation is known as Dirac equation. Yes. In 1929, Weil introduced the Weil equation. Though the next year, a simplified version of the Dirac equation for relativistic particles whose solutions predicted massless fermions um, with a definite handedness or chirality. I didn't know this. I'm glad I'm reading this. This is fascinating. This is a find. Who would have thought that this would be a little potted history of uh, quantum mechanics? The third relativistic quantum mechanical equation for spin one half fermion is Majorana equation. I've heard of this and it's mentioned in the paper. And the antiparticle of Majorana fermion is itself. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, it's well known that Dirac 
equation describes electrons, etc. However, the Waal and Majorana fermions have not yet been observed as an elementary particle in the laboratory or nature yet. I didn't know that. So the whole of geometric unity that's based on U6464 is a conjecture of a, um, of a mathematically um, determined um, elementary particle. So, you know, it's like dark matter would be within the U6464 and we haven't seen dark matter, which is true. We haven't seen dark matter. And um, it will gain his theory so much more cloud actually for him to say, this is where you should expect to see it. And when he's talking to Lex Friedman, he says he doesn't know what engine scales they'll be at. And he'd need a quantum field theorist to calculate that. So he knows the traits of the particles, he knows their charges, he knows their properties other than their energy scale. So um, it mentions energy scale there. Um, high energy physics and condensed matter physics attracts a lot of research. Several unique electronic structures um, in condensed matter behave analogously to elementary particles quasi fermions and graphene semi-metals while quasi particles was proposed and it's experimentally confirmed in wild semi-metals so they're making kind of metal materials it's, it seems um and i think that's about all we can get out of this and i won't be reading the whole paper it is how long um Oh, it's not too bad. It's got a lot of, my gosh, it's got a lot of credits. Um, that's a whole lot of acknowledgements. So these are the structures that they're playing around with. And um, Hamiltonians is an H thing. Okay. And we've got that table. Is that a Hamiltonian? I think so. Well, maybe. Um, I think it is. I think that's a Hamiltonian. Right. So it's just a big um, table. So there are all these things involving tables. And so the table I showed you up the top here, this, you can have a bigger one and you can put all sorts of stuff that you want to have calculated in there, like bits of equation and stuff. And it's a, a way of organizing all of your mathematics. So uh, rather than having a page of sums, you take the sums and you put them into all these cubby holes and then you kind of carry that around and say, take all of that and apply all of that onto that. And it's like, it does it all at once. Um, rather than you having to individually, correspondingly track every equation and make sure that everything ties with everything else. Um, so there's kind of like, a, it's like power math. So that's where that comes in. And so you need to have, when you're making a universe, right? I've been thinking about this. When you're making a universe, the kind of things that are really useful are you want to have um, some of this, right? This kind of tensors, that's that's really useful. So tensors are useful. And then you want to have a um, partial uh, differential equations, which is this thing that involves, uh, I don't think there's an example of it here, of, uh, that but that that's quite interesting so we're going to find an example of it in his paper which will be where so we want to find a symbol that i want which is going to be uh that's it right so that is his equations for the um 
two equations for the second order and first order equation. So there's ones with a square in it. That would be second order. Um, and I think the, that is a first order equation. Um, so anyway, so this symbol here is a partial differential. I don't know that it's going to let me copy it into the chat. Oh, it does. Oh, well done. So we know what a tensor is because I've just been covering it. And it's not like it's that easy to just say this is a tensor because the thing that's a tensor will look like that, but it will be written like that more usually with subscripts. So I can't put R with two Greek subscripts that's next to it in the chat. So that's that's a bit of a problem. Um, at least I don't think I can. Um, can I do anything with this Greek letter here? Yes, it lets me do that. So we can have that. So we're going to be using that for stuff. And then we're going to have one other thing. Uh, we want to have uh, Lie groups. So a Lie group will be something that allows us to do stuff with our um, um, differential manifold where we use a partial differential equation on it. And the notation of the Lie group will be something like this, and it'll be U of, um, say, 6464, for example. We do that. And probably that's it in terms of, like, I want to make a universe. What do I need? And you're thinking, well, you need to have a, um, a group here, and you need to have um, uh, spinners that are going to be, um, you, you, the, the Greek letters are a way of referencing um, fields, right? So the fields here, where you say, I'd like to have a Higgs field, or I want to have, uh, when it's complex, you want it to have um, a um, electron, uh, or you want to have a um, photon, or you want to have a Ritter Schwinger stuff, which is like complex again. Uh, and that's as far as it goes. It doesn't go up to this, but then he does use this to model the classical um, geometry of um, the pseudo Riemannian manifold. So, in a sense, it's all tensors, right? It's all tensors as the thing where he's keeping everything. It's not like some things are in one organizational structure mathematically and other things are in another. It's all inside of these tables, which you've got special mathematical, mathematical rules. But the, the mathematical rules, oh, there's one more thing. There's one more thing that you need, which I missed out on, which is so obvious. It's complex numbers, isn't it? So I need the complex numbers again. And we need to go to here. Now, I'm going to make myself have more than just the complex numbers. We're going to have the division algebras. So, shall we just look that up? Um, um, So I'm just posting something spurious in the chat here. So that is just any old thing. You can ignore it. But the point is, is it's just... Um, so there we go. So you have that. And what we've got there is we've got um, 
the division algebras. And then I'd like to have the video by Cole Fury at this point, since how it's pretty helpful. Um, right now which one was it because you've done loads of these so this summary at the end i think okay that's it that's the video um can i cut this off and have that about self. Have it a bit shorter. Yes, I can. It works. So that is going to be a cold fury video for people into math. And I think this is a good way of uh, smuggling um, in extra internal dimensions as needed. Because um, quantum field theory needs dimensions, uh, what you do about it, and so on, right? So there we go. Now, we won't dwell on this for now, but we will um, down, down the bottom there, is we've got um, something which is what is he doing? in his theory uh let's have a look we go to go to 12.10 is it and we have this title here so the title of this section is the modified young mills equation analog has a direct square root in a mutant einstein chan sermon's like equation right and you're like okay buckle up and we then get to this and we're dealing with spin, right? So the thing at the top here is a conventional way that it's looked at. And they have the spin values, which we've just been talking about, which are tensorial. And we have a, a rank zero would be a spin naught and it would be the Higgs field. You see that? And that is governed by the Klein-Gordon equation. Then rank a half, Tensors would be um, the Dirac equation. And Dirac got his equation by doing a kind of metaphorical square root of the Klein-Gordon equation. He didn't literally square root the Klein-Gordon equation, but he kind of metaphorically did it. And I think I covered that in the last video, but I can't remember whether the screen share cut off i think it might have done or i got pretty close to the end because it was um well we'll just keep going for now but there's a process by that and it's involved and i'm not going to cover it all again now but i showed how that was done in the other video and then there's yang mills and Yang Mills is a curvature equation and it's a vector thing of um, you have your tensors and they are rank one tensors and that means they are describing things like photons and um, gluons. So the vector bosons um, or gauge bosons are in that whole thing. And Yang Mills theory is the theory that they can make a theory which is a, a special unit group of an arbitrary n. I think that might be some other constraint, like it needs to be non-abelian gauge group, but I don't know what any of those words mean other than gauge group. So I'm just typing that in there to say, say there's a bit of it that I don't know. And I don't care that I don't know it, right? So it's like, don't care. 
okay? You've got to move ahead at some points and, and keep the momentum going, right? If it turns out it's crucial for me to know that Yang Mills is non-abelian or isn't it's abelian or whatever it is, and I need to know, learn about that, I will. But for now, I want to get this done and I want to get the video and I want to get through the introduction and into the reaction, right? So um, this is all just the introduction. So we get the young mills and then we then say, can we do the same thing with the young mills that Dirac did, metaphorically speaking, uh, apply the same strategy he applied uh, to get his Dirac equation. And then we need to get like a new Einstein equation, like the Einstein field equation, but it won't be uh, spin two, right? Because the way they're thinking is, oh, it's going to be spin two and it will involve gravitons. And um, Eric Einstein's thinking, no, it will remain being spin one and um, this equation will be in the same uh, sense of the yang mills equation it would just be another curvature equation and the the y will be related to the x but this is 14 dimensional and this is four dimensional so they're kind of incompatible dimensionally oh right like the yang mills isn't 14 dimensional ordinarily so he has to make it and extend it into being 14 dimensional so you then say well has he got any experience at doing that and the answer to that is yes, because he has done that in his PhD. So if you look for his PhD, which I reconstructed from um, It was on a website and it was hard to read <clears throat> because um, like this is the entry he has in um, Harvard, which is incorrect because it says that he has an advisor um, and he didn't have an advisor. So that's wrong. Um, So that's what it says there, and it says he got a PhD from Harvard in mathematical physics um, in 1992 for this paper, extension of the self-dual Yang-Mills equations across the eighth dimension. And I think that should say eighth dimension. So that's that. And then you dig around a bit on the internet and you find this. And this is the actual paper with the abstract. So you know you're looking at the previous paper before about the Richard Schringer. Uh, this one is um, the one he has for his um, um, PhD. And um, I'll just leave it on screen for a moment. Now you can see as you read that, but if you read to the end, right, skip over the bits you don't get. Read to the end, you see that it says, um, proposed extension to all even dimensions is sketched, right? So, and it is eight, it's not eight. So um, Harvard got the title of his paper wrong. So, um, This is like embryonic geometric unity. And he um, had this in 1992. It's a really long time ago. And um, oh, it's interesting here that it says it's been cited in this other thing. So it's not like it's had no impact. Uh, it's cited by Isidore Singer. That's who Singer is, I am Singer. So he didn't have an advisor, but he did spend quite a lot of time talking to Isidore Singer, apparently. So um, he's quite a, a big name in physics. So um, um, 
I mean, he, he he's probably destined to go off into string theory um, had he not had bad experience and um, he decided that it's, it's overly competitive and a l- lack of original ideas, I think, and people too keen to um, steal other people's work, maybe. I don't know. But I'm not getting into that now. Um, I think I've covered it in a comment on my one of my videos um i think it might be geometric unity in two minutes there's like a second comment to that that covers all the controversy to do with the uh, cyborg whitman so and it's um, it's better suited to a comment than it is to me rambling about things so you have that and um let's see um we go and we say he can do it with eight dimensions and i can't drag it in there okay you can do it with eight dimensions so you can do it with 10 even number dimensions 12 yes 14 yes okay so that looks okay there's a formula where you can complexify things and you can do it where if it's 4k plus 2 then it's okay so if m is equal to 4k plus 2, that's means you can complexify it and um, um, complexify it. So let's see if that will work with 14. So 14 minus 2 is 12 um, divided by 4, k equals 3. So I'll put 3 into the equation and say 4 times 3 plus 2 equals 14 so that checks out so you can complexify um, a theory that has been grown from 4 into 14 and then you can then take that complexified theory and then you can then um, decompose it from 128 down back into um, 64 64 which is what he does so uh, all of that's worked out and I won't go over how that's done right this moment uh, because I've already covered it in other videos and what I'm more interested in doing is talking about this thing which I was trying to talk about in the other stream and put a lot of effort into because it's very complicated and I was having to redo it all today and then it was um I have to plug this in and it's reminded me already i need to plug it in so anyway i had this and i um he's doing this thing with um yang mills and einstein dirac and all of that so let's see what that's all about so uh we need his paper here we we'll scroll it up and it says here these are the different spin groups and he says I don't need to have two um, spin two I can make do with zero ah can make do with zero that's the first time that's ever happened and I've had it for a really long time I wonder why it did that. Hope it's not going to start doing it regularly. It was extra loud. Sorry about that. Apologies. Okay, so you have this thing. And it's um, it goes zero a half um, one three and a half, um, and I suppose these ones are taken at the same time. But yeah, you get one and one, so it would be in terms of this theory, it would be spin naught would be um, a Yang Mills Higgs field, really. Well, he says it's a Klein-Gordon thing. 
So I'm just going to say Klein Gordon, um, Higgs, and then I'm going to say the half spin half will be for the fermions, and that will be um, the rack. And then I'd have the spin one would be for the bosons, and that one would be gauge bosons on Yang Mills. So we just have Yang Mills there. And the Yang Mills is for anything as the form um, SUN, which means it includes anything of that nature SUN, SO. 2n um, spin 2n and so on into complexified uh, spin 2n complexity and that's all possible so that was like green light for his theory is essentially conforming with a yang mills extension of a quantum field theory so G gu is a yang mills theory in the same vein um, and then we go to spin three over two. Um, and that is um, Marita Swinger. Now, um, it doesn't get mentioned in the equation, but he, I think he puts that in with the Dirac stuff. So we're going to put that in with the Dirac because it's fermionic. And then we're going to go to spin one again. No, there's no spin. Oh. I've gone past the other one that was the spin. Um, I should have put the two spin ones together. But I've now done it out of the sequence. So this thing here, spin one, is equal to um Chern Simons Einstein. Um we're gonna put that round the other way. We're gonna say Einstein Chern Simons. So um okay. Now I mean is it that he should actually make one of these things be a, a um a a rank two tensor without help? Will that help with this ship in the bottle problem? Because if he's trying to remove a mast for the curvature, would it be that he wouldn't have to, if in mapping it through, he's mapping it to a space that's got an extra dimension, and then the curvature can then lay into that extra dimension. So it's a sheer question mark fit into spin two Einstein. Okay, and I'm going to say Weinstein, right? That's an interesting thought. That's the first idea I've had that might be a potential fix for the shear issue, that it isn't all spin one, and him not wanting to use spin two because it's not been found evidence of it, and people are like saying, well, that's gravitons and whatever. Um, it's a next logical number up, and that's the fields that are in the um, thing here are, are two by two, right? So it's like, why not use use that and have it be that's where everything then uh, comes into play. It's a two by two thing. That's an interesting idea. So I think that might be that might be it with the if i go launch preview we've got the where is preview gone we haven't got the i don't think we've got it on screen have we oh it wasn't preview it was youtube um and i didn't see it on screen the is this it? No. That's Richie Kirchner. 
So let's have a look. That's strange. I thought I had it here. Um, I don't have the bottles. Wait, what's happened to the bottles? I'm going to have to get them from the portal group. Don't really want to have to look at them again. Um, oh, it won't be from here. Um, oh, we're going to go um, the portal group. No, it's pull it up, pull it up, Jamie, isn't it? Pull that up, Jamie. There, oh, I did have it. I had it down here, look. So we have... Um, oh, I ended up with two of these, didn't I? That's what's happened. So, right, we, we go into YouTube... So we have this and we have this bottle. What happened there? That's hopeless. What's going on? Oh, I see. I must have opened a window. So we've got these uh, curvature boat. And I think that might mean that it is in the Yang Mills because it's a second order. That's my guess. But it's not labelled and it's not narrated. Then, um, if we look at the equation and compare it to this, and we ignore that, because it doesn't matter, then we've got three masts. So if we do this, I'm going to lay a bet that there is a relationship here where the wild culture probably has something to do with this one. The traces reaching curvature probably has something to do with this one. The Ricci scalar has something to do with this one. But I don't know. So, um, shall we see? We we'll do some research and find out what the hell any of this is. Uh, so, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go done, and then I'm going to go back to the video, and I've got that on screen, right? So. I find all of this very hard to follow along with. The first mast is while. Curvature. The second is Tracis Ricci, which I will call, um, I, I won't call Tracis, I'll call it Trace Free Ricci, because I think that's what it was in uh, Wikipedia. And then we'll have third is going to be Ricci Scalar. Um, and the thing about that is, oh, I know. The Ricci Scalar is wrong. I've done that wrong. Do you see what I've done? The Scalar should be the other way around. Yeah. Okay. We'll get rid of this. Don't save. We'll do this again. So let's have another attempt. So we're going to have, we're not going to use red, we're going to use green. We're going to use that. That doesn't read very well. We're going to use, go back to using red. So we're going to have 
that. Then we have the R by itself on the back end there because it's a, it's a scalar term, like a half. So that makes sense for that to be the Ricci scalar, doesn't it? And then we want this term, which I thought was the metric. And I don't know whether this is anything connected to this. And this cosmological constant, we're just going to forget about. And this here, over here, this is um, the um, stressed energy momentum tensor. Um, we're not interested in that. This is nothing to do with the curvature. The curvature is equal to the mass. So that's effectively what that is, right? So, um, or like the mass multiplied by a small amount. So, uh, done that. And, uh, okay, okay, that's right. So, second is, third is a Ricci scalar. That's wrong. So, the second is a Tracy Ricci, that's wrong. So, the second mast is not the Trace Free Ricci. So, correct that. Um, second is the Ricci scalar. R. Third might be Trace Free Ricci. Now, the problem with his paper is he doesn't say um, where it is. You know, it doesn't exactly communicate the form of the Einstein field equation and then work and show the workings out and everything. So, trying to get from this into this form to understand how these things relate when I don't even know what that is, is a problem. And it's going to take some work. So, we're going to do that work right now. So we've generated an image, a screenshot of that. Now we need to annotate that with what that is. And There, will be nearly the last one. So this one here, put this on screen with this. So is it the same form? Uh, nearly, this cosmological constant is slightly around the wrong way. Um, the G mu nu is a metric tensor. Okay, so I don't think that's the same thing. Scalar curvature, might be the same thing as the Ricci scalar. I don't know for sure. Um, I knew I knew that T was a stress energy tensor. So we we're saying that the second one is the Ricci. Well, we don't know if it's a Ricci scalar, but we know it's a second is a scalar. So the diagram here is saying that the second is the scalar. curvature and I'm going to say question mark Ricci and then because the guy reaches Ricci Corabastro and I find it irritating that it doesn't just say C for his second part of his name oh hold on a minute no the, the first one is Ricci as well 
So, um, huh. I see. What's distinguishing them? That is different because it's got the terms, right? Yeah? That is different from that because that doesn't have any Greek letters. So it's a scalar. I see. I see. So the terms, the Greek letters of the first term means that it is Greek, means it's four by four, which is a Ricci uh, curvature tensile. All right, okay. And then G mu nu, um, is the metric so presumably that would be one three to make it be space timey and uh that's it so um i now need to know the screen grab of that but not annotate it in any way i need to know where the wild fits in and where the traces fits in. I have the Ricci scalar as the term that goes here. So I've established one of the things of the boat as being this one here is this one here. That's all I've got so far as a puzzle. So the back, the third one in the boat is um, no, not the third one in the boat, the second one in the boat. First one, second one, third one. So it's the second one, which is R. No subscripts is the scalar. Richie. Okay. And it is the scalar curvature. Gotcha. So, um, and then we do the first one is the um, Richie Curvature Tensor. Um, mu Nu. Right, okay, and I don't know whether the metrics involved in this. Oh, hold on a minute, it's not because this bottle is a space of metrics, so this is without metrics, and this gets the metrics. Right, let this play out. The metrics is this, and the metrics is S2 tangent or co is at the cotangent space of X. So you go and you have X, you go and take the tangent to it, and then you take the tangent to the tangent, and then you say, say, S2, what's S2? What's S2? Oh, I know, it's a direct square root. Is that right? By taking a space and then you're saying, take it and make it into double what the space is. So it, if it was S1, it would be treating it as, as the equation would be moving onto a line. So a linear equation onto a linear line and well, it would be incompatible because it would be a, a two term here onto a one term, which you couldn't do. So what he does is he promotes this into a two term. Now, he's not squaring this because these are, these are spaces, not numbers. So he says, make it a space and then I will 
square that space. So that means that if this is the space of metrics, and the space of metrics is what would it be? Will it be four dimensions that are then multiply by themselves into being four by four to get to 16? Or will it be worse than that? Will it be an extension of Yang Mills to 14 dimensions? to get the curvature thing in 14 dimensions, and then to make that fit, he then has to go off and take his 14 dimensional extension of the Einstein field equation, and then do the direct thing of turning it into that. So it takes the terms, the, it takes the, the, it takes the four terms that you would ordinarily get, and he makes it into like 14 terms. And then he goes and says, have that both ways. And that will give you your 14 by 14 table. Um, and then I'll have a diagonal and they'll be looking to cancel out the uh, off diagonal terms. Uh, so he has a horizontal space for X, gets a tangent fiber bundle from it. Then he goes and gets a cotangent from that which is like um it's i don't really understand why he does that but he does that in the lecture as well whether this t star x is equal to h it might be um it cannot be on the stream now but we'll we watch after okay um so this i think this is S2 um, is um, squaring the space of, um, now what would you call it? Would it be the metrics? Um, Yeah, because the thing is, T is actually the principal fiber bundle. Uh, T is a tangent, it's right angles to the reality space of uh, P at right angles to reality X, um, which is already a tangent. and then hinged by star to be horizontal and H. So it's now off the fiber banner. The fiber bundle P. Why would you want to do that though? So that I don't know. Because you maybe it isn't H already. Maybe Is it because of the levy Shivita connection? Because you're going to need that to get to 1, 3. So it's going from Y14 to X4, and then in the process it's getting... Um, X one three. I do subscripts and everything, but I, I'm too lazy. So it looks like this is a direct square root. Um, oh hi, Kali. Um, um, I can't remember how to type. Hi, Kali Leskinen. 
let's get in there. hi there so we're doing the very advanced mathematics here um so this should be the metaphorical focal direct square root which you didn't really do which you covered in the other video that i did um applied applied as a similar technique um to the yang mills equation for bosonic fields uh, extended to 14 dimensions i think and that should be legitimate or it might be 14 14 complexified dimensions maybe um and so we do that and so we're putting the boat of curvature into the space of metrics there are no metrics on y y is topological spinners um no metric and then x inherits um a metric from y and the uh gauge group u 64 64 okay so let's look at this so we look at that and the things going into the bottle things are breaking up the only mask that we're familiar with is the richie scalar mask which is this term here this r term next to the half so a half r is um the ricci um scalar curvature and we are keeping that okay and then the um that's the one at the back so that is the third um mast at back of the boat well says ship and then um i don't know which one is the traces ridgy but these things here where it says g mu nu those are metrics so g mu and nu are metrics so we haven't put those on there so are we just trying to get rid of this because it doesn't fit the other two because it doesn't have that and if that's the if i my inference holds then whatever this is uh, which it says in the notes that the first mask is the Ricci curvature tensor so the first mask um the Ricci curvature tensor um with its guards mu nu um we um kill it off right and it's his language he says kill it off and so uh that might be the while curvature now is it synonymous with that synonymous i don't know it could be that it's just you see if it's called the richie one it would be richie's work but if it's also called the wild coach i feel like i might be picking the wrong thing and the wild curvature might be another thing or is it that the wild curvature may have come first and then the richie curvature was an elaboration of the work of wow so the richie curvature guess here that the richie uh, curvature tensor includes 
the while curvature. Now, does it kill off the component of the while curvature tensor, or does it from the Ricci curvature tensor, because it's undesirable, and it does leave this in here, and then it doesn't apply the metric to this term, but it applies the metric to the other two terms. Because the thing is, is that there's curvature in the boat. Oh, I see, I've misread the whole diagram. There's curvature in the boat, right? Yeah? So that's a curvature as well. So does that count as a curvature? Because it could do that the shear, the ship, is R. Oh, oh, if that's the case, that makes it make so much more sense. So there's a while component to the curvature boat, and the curvature boat is mainly that, but it's got a bit of while polluting it. And you want to get rid of that while. That could be the case. And then I don't know where the traces reach is, but I don't know that I need to care. Um, I mean, I could do due diligence on all of this and check it all. Um, but as this part of his work is all a bit up in the air anyway, because it's not formally defined, should I really make the effort? I mean, he's not explaining himself that well. So I don't know. So that breaks that off. And that is how things are with general relativity where you don't have the wild curvature, but you you would keep this. The thing is, is this would be this. So that, oh, oh no, that doesn't contain the wild curvature. The wild curvature must be something extra written onto it. So we could say like W mu nu, if it's a tensor, if it's a wild curvature tensor, there'd be a, like a W mu nu that would be added into this. And you want that got rid of. So you can then say the base of the boat is that and then the rest of it is that. So let's do that. Um, I've no idea if this is going to be correct, but we'll try. So... In fact, what I'll do is I'll do that again because I'm over my own screen. So we just change this down a bit. See the end state there. We're going to do this. And we do this. And we're doing this. So, right. The curvature thing is this. And I'm now counting it as being R mu nu. Then there's a term possibly that would have been, um, we're going to call it W, the wild um, coverage tensor, and then we're going to say mu nu. And that's just a wild guess. So this part here, I'm thinking that is a bit that you don't get with Einstein, and that gets got rid of, and so that ends up flying over there. And so the action of it going in the bottle and breaking off is this action of it going, we don't need you no more. Okay, so that will be getting rid of that, and presumably that's wild culture is inherent to um, the space um, Y. So that would be the space Y. And then we're taking it into the space of metrics here, which would be the space X. And, but is the space X in four dimensions or 14? I think that I'm guessing that they're both in 14. 
to make the math easier to make it so that they're both comparable dimensionally because the thing is with Dirac he ended up with it being I mean I'm not going to draw in a whole thing but it's going to be like one of these is going to be um I'm going to write that up into seven. That's going to be four. Right, so you can see how many that's going to be when you draw in the whole grid. That's going to be massive. And they've got the same one over the other side, but it's going to be blue. And so these two things are going to be interrelating and um, you're basically looking to get the stuff that's on this diagonal into the, um, wait a second. Yeah, you're looking to get it onto the diagonal of this one. Um, and then there's nothing else in there. The rest of it is like um, blank. It's only on a diagonal. Is that right? Well, have I got that wrong, around the wrong way? No, it's around the wrong way. It's um, this, this side, when you do this, and you make your Einstein field equation into a Weinstein sort of equation, that is the thing that you're squaring, yeah? So you're doing S and S. You're doing S here against S here. And you've got, you've got 14 against 14. And you end up with a whole bunch of stuff. And then it's a question of like cancellations of all of these things against each other, corresponding across the... Um, the sides to the center as it was with the Dirac equation. So all of these things will be um, multicolored um, I'd fill in the whole thing. Like, they'd all be different um, Like that. So imagine the whole thing like that. And then the, the things that are off the diagonal, that's yellow, they cancel with the corresponding one on the opposite side, according to some math that's involved. Non-commutative algebra involving complex um, numbers and matrices. So you're looking at kind of Dirac gamma matrices. Um, on on all of that, and he had what was it four? So this would, would this be fourteen gamma matrices? I don't know. So yeah, so his Dirac equation could be part of the Einstein field equation if the Einstein field equation needed this to have energy coming into it. And the energy comes from the Dirac equation. So um, that might be something. So part of that Dirac thing could be there. And then you'd have the curvature equation over here in Y wouldn't just be this. It would be this. Right, because it would be the Higgs equation with in terms of the Klein Gordon equation. And as before, the um when you do a square root of the Dirac, it's like taking a a square root of the Higgs um Klein Gordon equation. So this is in terms of two, and you, what you're looking to do is you're looking to do that. And then you can't be doing that. So what you do instead is you 
square this and then you go off and you get rid of that and now you just left with the problem of this and then later having to square root it but at the moment you've got a correspondence where you can go um Oh, why can't it remember the colour I want? You want to take that and you want to put that into there. Now that's um, been done before by Dirac, but it's not been done in 14 dimensions. So you'd be looking to do that in 14 dimensions. And that would then inform T. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Um, because 14D... 14D, that's 14. Okay, so we've got the Higgs going to the Dirac equation manifesting as a stress energy momentum tensor. And then we have the, I don't know what he does with his cosmological constant, but then he has, I'm thinking that the boat itself, the ship itself is the, um, whatever the hell this was. This was the Ricci curvature tensor. So I'm going to write it down there. It might be wrong, but I'm going to annotate this because, um, okay, so the boat, the actual boat itself is that. And that and that are the same thing. So it's not a mask that you get rid of. And it does not include the wild curvature tensor, which was part of the equations of Einstein, presumably, while he was working it all out. And then at some point, it was like, oh, I won't be wanting that in my space of metrics. So he went and got rid of it. And he took it out that way. Um, To get out like that. Okay, so now what? Um, so what's being done in the yellow above here, um, and it needs to be done again because it needs to be done in 14 dimensions, that's going to have to be done here between these two things. And um, um, that's curvature, that's curvature. So what is involved in doing that? Um, presume, I don't know, it will, rather than vectors, it's going to be partial differentiation, partial differential equations. Is that what we're into? It's all going to be this. So that's going to make it more nightmarish, uh, possibly. So it's 14 dimensional with partial differential equations. Um, and it's done with this square here. That's the important bit there. That, because it's a square space and it's like, that would be like first onto second, and then it's making two of it. And then the way you then do it is you cancel out those terms, cancel, and then you've got the line by itself, and you compare it to the line on the left. And so you get the two lines, and you're saying that one, and that one's one, what we're left with. And then whatever you ended up having this as your extension and he's extended things before when he did his PhD. So this is PhD, um, which is extension. It's not to eight, but it's to, not to 10, not to 12, but it's to at least 14 and possibly 14 there. But I don't know for sure if he's doing that. 
that could involve complex numbers. And that could complicate things. That could complicate the math. So you might need to do the jab um, in the complex space. Um, now, it might not be in a complex plane, it might be um, that he'd use this, so he'd be using quaternions. Might be an idea, see so it's 4D. But the thing is, is that it isn't 4D, it's going to be 14D. So what do you do about that? Can you have multiple ones together? So if if you, this is really going out on a limb. Octonians are going to be eight. Um, quaternions are going to be four. That's going to be two. Reels are going to be one. Um, trying to think how to get to 14. If we do four eights, that's going to be 16 already. It's too much. Eight seems to be a bit overpowered. Are we adding them or are we multiplying them? I think we're adding them. We're adding the dimensions, are we? So, oh, well, that's easy. You just do these three. You do octonians by uh, that, and that will be your complex, right? So you don't need these. Now, can you create a, a, well, these, these all involve real numbers, but you don't then put them in with a real plane. How do you mean? Well, you don't have, you don't have it be like R4, S1 or something. Right, don't do any of that Kaluza Klein nonsense. Um, you don't do that. That will give you 8 plus 4 plus 2. 8 plus 2 is 10, plus 4 is 14. So that could work if I understand how this is, and I might not. That will give you 14. So, um, if you needed to construct something, you wouldn't use quaternions, you'd use this as an algebra, and you would make that work with your thing. So let's do it here, and it would be um, There. So that gives you 14 dimensions that are, well, if you only need 10, you can have 10 by just having C and O. So that would be um, C and O if you only need 10. But I would have thought you needed a full 14 because you've got um, need of it because it's um, generalized up to 14. So this would be 14. Let's say it's 14 then. Um, so we won't have that on the top left. And I've no idea if this is actually 
going out on the stream. Let's just have a quick check. Um, that might be working. So I'm, I could work on this another half an hour or more. But I'm trying to convey um, what might be happening with his thing down um, there. I've got down there. Do you see that? So this thing here um, is this. So um, this is the Einstein case, right? And I'm not showing the video of him with the other case, but I can infer from how he did the shear of shrinking uh, some of the things and taking them in while still breaking off one of them. Um, my main concern is this, of killing off the wild curvature, which I've put in there and I have could have completely wrong. So don't take any of this. Take this all uh, on a caveat emptor, right? So um, we're looking to try and recover space time um, with a, um, a Lorentzian metric, and we're in Y, and we're trying to get to X. And it's like, how do you start off with X4? Well, you go off and you have this structure group or gauge theory, which is on U64, 64, 64, and then you work your way back through a chimeric fiber bundle, uh, which that is embedded within, and then take a section of that, and then that goes through the levi civitia connection, and in so doing, you end up having to employ the shear operator to um, get rid of the um, wild curvature uh, contribution to the Ricci curvature tensor. Um, so it, it looks like how it does in the top right hand corner that's encircled in yellow. And then you have it so that um, that's good. And then you have it so that you elaborate your Yang Mills curvature equation for y to 14 dimensions because you'll be needing that to um, understand the behavior of omega on y and you basically got the Einstein field equations on both but in a different form you've got like although although i mean they're not um it's just that there's like an affinity, there's a similarity to, between the two, he's recognized. So he's like saying, the Dirac equation is a form of the Higgs equation, and the Dirac equation could be where you get your stress energy momentum tensor from. So that might be, because I mean, this, the stress energy momentum, right? The momentum is something you get from the Dirac equation, because it's a momentum of an electron. So let's say that that's where that comes from. That's where that T top right hand corner comes from. Um, so the conventional way for that would be that would be um, this would come from. there I need a bit more room that's okay do that so 
the Dirac equation has to be squared for this equation here to be as if it was squared, as if it was squared. Because as it is, it is, the term is squared and you really want it to be as if it wasn't squared. And you're thinking, well, you're making it worse by making this one squared to match this one. But in doing that, and then making them equal, you are making this one the square root. And then what you do at the end of it, having calculated it, you end up square rooting this, and this you can square root, but this you can't square root. So that's why it's a metaphorical square root. And then I covered this in the other video, all about the direct square root at some length. And then what happened was I never got around to talking about this because it went wrong. So this is how he is in going to do his unification because he's got some of it for this, I think, would be this side of the equation. And this would probably be on the left-hand side. So that would be um, uh, this I can draw on. Can I? I can draw on it. I can draw on it. Let's do that. We can go off and draw on it. How big is this? Right, we're going to get rid of the equals. There. In fact, we're going to get rid of the cosmological constant. Here's how it's not being mentioned. And then we're going to put in a minus sign. We're going to go minus. And then we're going to go... All right, and then we're going to go here, we're going to go here, and we're going to go zero. And then we're going to have to have this all equal to zero. And so we're going to have another equation that's equal to zero. So sometimes it's ordinarily, I can't remember what the direct equation looks like, is it's f of a and d star something of a, something like that. So we're just going to say, um, I don't know, f uh, plus minus of a, and then d something, like right? some bullshit, right? So that's going to be that, and we're going to make it, so however that has to be, that is then made to be equal to zero. And... We're looking for something that looks somewhat similar to that. And then we're looking to tie together this zero to this zero for an equivalence. Because this is in 14 dimensions down here. And we want this here to be in 14 dimensions as well. After we put it through our um, process of... Um, stuff but in all of this we're going to need to have a shear the shear is going to look like this and then once it goes in the bottle it's going to be the inverse so to get it in the thing with the masts, it's going to have to shrink the masts and then bring them back up again. Um, and it's going to have to bring them up again from their fold position. And But it does break this off um, as it did before. That has to go. And it's something to do with gauge invariance um and i don't know whether this is gauge invariant i think it might be so that's gauge invariant that's gauge invariant that's gauge invariant and i think that's all i can say on it um 
and whether or not what I'm saying here about the uh, division algebras and um, Cole Fury, whether that is any help, I don't know. The thing is, we've got the book he mentions in his um, paper, and this is Spinners and Calibrations by S. Rees Harvey. And the section that seems most likely to be uh, of relevance is um, Spinner's Clifford Algebras, the complex Clifford Algebras 190, which is split into another section. So 190 and then another part is in the split case and I think it might be in the split case because, well, we are ultimately dealing with a split case, aren't we, of 64, 64, unless we're dealing with the 128C case. Or would that count as one as well? Um, hmm. In this, the numbers from the split case are the two Ps of the same P. So on page 277, no, 227, it would be that. So we're looking at page 233. I'm going to look at page 233. Oh, it's Reese Harvey. Reese Harvey. So let's go and see if we get this right. Two, three, three. Um, there is a table which looks promising, but I don't know that that's anything of significance. So the table is um, there. Table 11.5. Sure, he's quite capable of reading it himself. Page 108, page 208. So this is matrix algebras isomorphic to CLRS. So that allows you to have R and S different. I don't know whether they have to be different But if S could be um, complex, um, oh, hold on a minute. CLRS has dimension two to the N as a real vector space. So I don't think it can be complexified. Let's have a look. So we're looking for something that's like 108. And 28. There's one here, second one down near the margin. That's um, how far is it? Um, the yes, second one down by the margin is M 128C. So it would be there, right? There's that on there, and it's like nearly at the top. The one at the top is N256R, um, and the one on the diagonal um, is M128R. And then you go one over to the left, it's M64R vector product with M64R. So that seems to be a bit like what we're dealing with in terms of U6464. So is it that as we go this way, these are included within this? And then is it that as we go that way, vertically, they're included as well? So that would mean that they're included within M128R. Hmm. And you go that way, it'd be 
m128 plus m128, both of them are. Hmm. Okay, so we've got that, and then we start at the bottom of the page here, and then uh, we've got complex uh, Clifford algebras, and it's even numbers, 2p, and I don't know what end means. CLC two P is isomorphic to CLPP with um, R of C, right? which is equation 12.55. Right, that's disappeared. Right, well, there we go. Equation 12.55. So leave it there. So that's as far as it gets. It's like, four pages out of the whole book so um, I don't know if that's any help um, so I am not suggesting I have any like, insights into how to fix the shear operator in a capacity as a mathematician or as a physicist right I'm just seeing patterns and uh, my limited knowledge and guesswork, guesswork that's got me from knowing basically nothing to being able to talk at this level about geometric unity. I'm getting into something that is not well defined within the theory, right? The, he probably was in a rush to get done before the deadline and was relying on having notes already prepared for it and then found he lost them, right? So... That's why it's not in there. He probably thought, oh, well, I can do that next week because it's over in that door and the goes to look and it's not there. So it's like, shit, right? And it's so such old work. He's not familiar with how uh, these things are done anymore. He might have done it in like 1992 or something. So it's an absolute eternity ago. So maybe he if he was like to delay the release of his paper in um, 2021 by a year, he might be able to um, have a crash course on how to do these things. Maybe it isn't this book. Maybe it's another book that he was thinking of. Uh, maybe he needs to go back to the book um, in Stanton's um, book. Maybe it's something to do with that. That might be part of it I don't know um, but this is where the uh, Yang the Einstein Dirac um, is a square with the Yang Mills Higgs Klein Gordon equation and it seems as if that um, it says in extreme abuse of notation we might write that and I find that this is kind of confusing so another way of writing it which would be a bit clearer, would be to say the following. Um, it's in the classical sense of Dirac, we're going to do Klein Gordon, we're going to just do it all in black. We're going to do Klein, oh hell, why did it have to disappear? No, that's no good. Do it again. Come on, work. So you have this. We're going to have Klein Gordon, Klein Gordon, and we're going to say, well, it is, it's squared. And then Dirac comes along and he wants to do his thing. 
And it's like, oh, what I'd really like to have is I'd like to have that square rooted. So he tries to square root it, but it's not possible to square root it. You can't do it with that math. So undeterred, he goes off and he squares his thing. So he goes off and says, I am going to square my thing. And then I'm going to um, square that as well. Yeah. Now the effect of squaring a square root is to cancel it out. Now you've got the equation as it stands ordinarily, and then it's got his equation, which isn't what he wanted, because he wanted to just find it for d, but now he's got to find it for d squared. So he gets really imaginative now, and he goes off and says, right, I'm going to make a square, literally, and I'm going to put the terms of my thing, like time and space, along the diagonal, and then I'm going to square it. And so it ends up with a whole bunch of other terms in all of this space, right? And then it's like, but the problem is, in this one, there's only four terms. So if I arrange them, I have to arrange them along the diagonal. And I've got like black space all around them. So then he's like saying, well, there's ways around this. I can kind of see things here that kind of look the same and that can cancel each other out. And you keep doing that with special mathematics and you end up with the same bar in both cases. And then that gives you your answer, but it's still, don't forget, it's still squared. So then he has to then square root it. And I think they are, um, and that's like, you kind of, you're not square rooting this. You're not, you're not doing that. That stays as it was. So that is just used to get to this, right? Okay. So now he does that and he ends up with his Dirac equation and he gets it written on the floor of Westminster Abbey. Um, I can't remember what it looks like. It's something, is it, I'm gonna go by memory. Is it, that it? I'm not sure. Something like that. So anyway, um, now this is a, something to do with the uh, motion of the electron and it's that gives you its momentum in um, um, special relativity, relativistic momentum. So um, if you could bung in a few of these partial differential equations, then you're probably en route to making it work on a differential manifold. And you could then say, um, let's have it work on um, Uh, let's have it work on X, one, three. So that was having to deal with curved space and that complicates things a lot. Whereas this was special relativity. Um, we're now dealing with general. Now, 
this Klein Gordon equation could be seen as being um, is that where where's the Higgs and the Higgs is um, on a curved surface as part of the uh, let's see the the Klein Gordon zero the Klein Gordon zero Klein Gordon wait a minute where did I write that Klein Gordon with potential Young Mills Higgs field so this here that is um, don't really want that like that. I've somehow moved this. Right, we want to have the Young Mills Higgs field there. And then we also have that there. It's also Young Mills. And then I'm thinking the Dirac and the Rotor Stringer is happening on the blue. And then gravity is happening on the blue. Oh, that's nice. Why does he not organise this diagram a bit different then? You see, the thing is, is this diagram, is he could put the three. Three over two is bigger than one. So, um, what he needs to be doing is he needs to be taking this three over two and he needs to be putting it down the bottom. So if we go and mend this, he put it down here, then he go Rarita Schwinger. Right, and then and I can't remember which one of these fields was with Richard Schringer. I have a feeling it was this, this, the Zeta one. Um, I have a feeling it was the Zeta one. Um, so I'm going to go like that, and then we're going to go and we're going to get blue again right so this is happening because it's firmly on it it's happening there is that where it's happening presumably i mean it's it's affecting this dark matter it's happening and it's affecting um galaxies so you want it in our universe rather than behind the scenes so everything that's pink is behind the scenes um it'd be nice if you could group more the other way, where it was the spin things, all the blues were together. It's not really possible to do that. I prefer to have an ascending tower of spin as it is at the top. It makes it more similar to this and to have it be like this. So. What's strange is it's like it's alternating colours. It's like if that one is that one, and that one's that one, then the other colour is here. Like that. Which is Hmm. So um, I suppose I am um, I know what you could do. Um no, you wouldn't be able to do that. Never mind. 
it doesn't matter it's a, it's a nitpick really um it's just a question of like you see the two one two two i don't know what order means um i think it's just a bit confusing to have the first one 12.8 ascend it you know in number and the other one don't it'd be better on the way to have the top one like have a blank insert here for three over two with, with it empty and then this one have it so that it put three over two in sequence down the bottom so the problem then becomes um you got two lines that are both one but then here you've got two things on the same line that are both different numbers and they're all on the same line so why is it the yang mills and the chen simons einstein aren't showing the same line if there's the same spin um i suppose they are oh the order might be that it's it's like um this this is what the order is is it so this here is the order order maybe well if all the blue ones are order one Oh, I see what he means by having Einstein not be two. He's like saying that that Einstein should be not order two, but order one. Uh, I see. I see the argument now why that is should be order one because it's blue. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense now. Okay. Um, what would it be if it was order two? If it's order two, that's one and a half, it would mean Chen Simons Einstein would go after that, which would mean if it was two, that was two, then it would end up being here, and you'd go, um, That's if you end up using the full size of the tensor there for it to go there. And then you say it's a, it's a two. Now, if it's a two, then you don't need to do the Klein Gordon. You don't need to do the direct square root, do you? Because it's already two. Yeah. You see, see that? So this, it no longer needs to have the trick because um, now the, the register stringer, is that going to be on a two or is it going to be on a one? It might be that the, hold on a minute, why can't everything be on a two? Why can't you upgrade the spinners to two and the Marita Springer to two? Because I just came across this paper and then we're talking about, oh, we're really struggling with the math. So we made it so it was two dimensions. And I'm like, so doing it in four dimensions is like way hard with this condensed matter physics thing. And I thought, well, maybe um, you need more room. Maybe you need to take this space that you say we're taking it from a second order down to the first order 
maybe make it and we promote the first order back up to the second order and then everything's the same order so you promote that to being um promote that to be second order no i want to be on the other pen so i want to do that and i want to make that second order that second order and then that second order so i make everything consistently second order so all of these things would have to be squared so we're already doing the directs this is already being squared here right and we just do that but we also do it to the river to swinger equation or when we factor it out down here it gets squared so that would need to be squared there like that okay um and then the einstein equations will get squared um look there, there are four by four matrices right would it not be easier to just do 16 by 16 because that would be these squared wouldn't it now i know it's geometric unity and it's 14 but Now you've got the problem that I've been over this before. The problem is you can't do chirality. You can't do P symmetry. There is a way of having it be a five dimensional universe that includes a client and then you put it into the formula of D squared plus 3D divided by two. And it ends up when D is equal to five it means you get m is equal to 20 then you take away 16 and you get four and that's quite promising but it doesn't complexify because 4k plus 2 equals 20 would mean that that would be 18 and then it's 4k equals 18 and it doesn't find up because it's it would be k is equal to um what's it four and a half so that doesn't work um unless 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 the d you 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 leverage the d the extra dimension of the d to be a plus bi and then this part of the complex number system that's embedded in s1 which is put with the um you have your Riemannian manifold r4 with s1 then you have it so that um that then means you take that um s1 and then one number you have in there is a complex number and that smuggles in an extra dimension into one and then you go and say um take that complex number and we will have that get use because the fifth dimension of the Kaluza Klein you then go off and have that extra dimension not just be a real number but a complex number and then you then take that complex number when you need the complex number to do your um decomposition so you have a spin 20 um comma c where the c's come from the um you pulled it out of the fabric of the universe right it's embedded in in small right and then 
it then goes away again. And that might explain why we aren't aware of the complex numbers. Um, because um, it then divides up. And then that would be um, splitting into spin um, 10, 10. And then we look for the group size. And the group size would be two to the power of uh, ten. Is that right? What that right? Two to the power of ten. What would that be? Thousand twenty-four. Um, let's see. Eight, nine, ten. That's two hundred fifty-six. Five hundred twelve. Yeah, thousand twenty-four. What's interesting is this is what he was doing in his PhD because he had a thousand twenty four as a number there. So this would be U one thousand twenty four C and then it end up being wild spinners that were U five hundred twelve five hundred twelve. It's quite a bit bigger. So um so this is what happens if you use second order and you square everything. Now, if you've got it that big, can you square root that? I mean, can you square root the structure, the structure group when it's 512? Or is that something you don't do? You can do it with 256. 256 is like 16 times 16, isn't it? But 512, no, it's, it's, it's double, and then um, a number that would be squared. So that's, a, that's an issue. Don't think that there's a way of square rooting it. Because that's like square rooting 10, isn't it? You can square root 8, can you? No. I don't know. Um, is it 16 that you're multiplying to get 2 by 6? It is, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. This is all speculation. So... Okay, so I want to make that clear that this is all speculation and it should all be approached as such. Um, right. Well, we'll grab that and um, we'll
chocolate. Some biscuits. Right, can't just keep eating grapes. Get boring. Okay. That's a lot of screen captures all on top of each other, isn't it? So let's see how close I was with my Dirac equation, shall we? So, um, uh, gamma mu nu uh, p mu nu equals mc. So, can this be done with the Yang Mills? I don't know. But it's like it's the same thing again, but with Yang Mills. So you've got that for the Klein Gordon, then you're going to do it with the Yang Mills, which is going to be this thing. And so you're going to have the matrix here, which is going to be for Yang Mills. And that is going to get to be left alone whilst the Einstein field equations um, are made into being squared. Now, if these are in 14 dimensions already, are there going to be 14 dimensions that are then squared? And won't these have to be upgraded to be in 14 dimensions? Or am I missing something? Is he going to be doing these in 10 dimensions? And these in 10 dimensions? Because it's happening in spin 6-4. There's one or two ways it could go. It's either happening in spin 6-4 and that's happening effectively is having to interface in spin six four because he's got he's got he's got ten Einstein field equations and he's got these ten if it was spin ten that would be spin ten or is it the full enchilada of spin effectively fourteen? And that means it's a lot more to do. I mean, could you say if you had it be spin 14, You try to do it on the same number of spins because the thing is, is that you're. I'm thinking about the principal fiber bundle. I'm thinking about how it's not anywhere near wide. Or I want that to be a lot wider. You've got the principal fiber bundle here. And I know that we end up getting a section out of it. The section comes out like that, and that's X. Um, but I think that what he's doing is he's doing it in terms of C. We've got C here. No, that's not C. Doing it in terms of, what did I use for C? I can't remember. I can't, did I use green? I can't remember. So all of this, the fiber bundle, that includes everything, what we see. So is he got to get the math to work in the space of C? Or is C just architecture around which an internal mapping has to take internally which could be 14 or it could be something smaller like 10 
And so there's a little bit with with that that's 10. So the biggest that gets is spin sits four and then uh, spin one three. Um, hmm. Is that legitimate mathematically? Do they not need to be the same thing? I know that you can add them. You can go like this. And you go, you know, six and one, and then four and three, and it'll get you seven, seven. I know that, but... I don't know anything about the math of this to know whether this is okay. Now, when the critic went off and went through his work, he never brought up anything about this. Now, it could have been beyond his understanding, or it could be there's nothing wrong with it. But he was picking up on quite technical things. The technical things he was picking up on were um, based on a misunderstanding of the content of the lecture because the lecture was inconsistently presented. The lecture made it look like it was you, 128, and it wasn't. It was you, 128C, which then becomes you, 64 64. So, um, you know, if you don't see the the, the, the uh, slide of the fermionic field content, you're a bit lost on this. But um, I, I, what I'm a bit stumped on is what is being meant down here by squaring it. Are you squaring the Einstein field equations as they are, where there's 10 of them, which means you, what, you'd have 100? Or are you saying you want to extend the tensors that are in them so that rather than be 16 by 16, they would be 14 by 14? Presumably, you could apply Bianchi identities to that. So you'd have um, 14. Oh, come on, change the fucking thing. 14 by 14. Uh, and then there was the larger number of equations. And then you'd have um, Bianchi identities. But I wouldn't know. How to clarify all of this. Now the thing is, let's say you whittled it down a bit, um, the number. Um, and you're assuming that you can do the same again with young nulls. I don't know if it's even worth the effort. You might as well brute force it. Because when you've got all of this, you've got a corresponding number of things. I suppose you would do it because if you could say none of these certain things don't contribute to the result, and you say we're interested in the cancelling everything else and then leaving with the central diagonal, then you're looking for the central diagonal in this. And then... It's going to be 14 terms on the on the, on the leading diagonal on the ascending diagonal and that's going to map across and then you're going to do a square root of this that's going to get you to um that but the square root is going to be of They're all going to be little um, tensors that are 14 by 14 tensors, aren't they? 
I don't know. I mean, can you have matrices inside of matrices? It's got like an array of arrays. So like you have an array and you say, here's an array, simple array. And inside this array, I'm gonna have an array like that. Now, on a computer, you just represent that by having a letter. And then the letter, you define that as being the array. Right? Now, how would you do an indexing of that? If this was an array B, how would you index into this to get to, say, um, C? How would you get to that? You'd go B. And you want to get entry, which is going to be, this is going to be 0, 1, 0, 1. And you're going to go row column 0. And then you're going to go 1. That gets you to um the entry a then you're going to treat this as the entry a and you're going to do another bracket but this time the bracket is going to be this bracket just to make it clear we're referencing in a and then we're going to go zero one zero one and that's going to get us to one one and that's going to be c Okay, that's interesting. So you, I've got a semantics, if I wanted it, to have nested arrays. Uh, I think I'll have that in my programming language. That's not a bad syntax, is it? Well, you just uh, put the next set of indices after it. So you've got one to get hold of the array that's inside of the array, and then you could keep going as many times as you like. Yeah. That's not bad at all. Okay. Well, I've exhausted all I can say about this. Um, thing about the Einstein Dirac thing. Um, so we're going to move off from this and we're going to close out that and that and that and this. I don't really think I I said this correctly, but I, what I meant to say is that the his Klein Gordon gets a square root that yields a Dirac, and then the Yang Mills gets a square root that yields the Einstein. But another way of looking at it is to say square both sides. So both of these get squared, and then those being squared is equal to this. Um, but for that to work mathematically, if this is like the this up here, then this needs to be a minus, and that needs to be equal to zero. So it'd be Einstein minus Dirac equals zero equals Yang Mills minus Higgs, where that's also equal to zero, and that would be. The equation. So I'll I tell you what I can do. I can put that in the chat. That's something I'm thought of doing. So we're gonna go Einstein minus Dirac is equal to Yang Mills minus um 
pigs. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I've done a mistake. I've made a mistake because that on the left is squared. So both of the times on the left are going to have to be individually squared. So it's not that. It's going to have to be E squared minus D squared equals Yang Mills squared because it all ordinarily is squared. But not Yang Mills squared, but it's just Yang Mills as it naturally comes. So I'll leave it Yang Mills as it naturally comes, which is naturally squared. Yeah, okay. And both put in terms of um, put in um, a square, a literal square. And then we're looking for the ascending diagonal after cross term cancel okay uh, now uh, Yang Mills um, extended to 14 D and then we go Einstein um, extended to to 14d as well maybe or uh, is it only 10d now one of the things that i wanted to note and um, this is something where i i do not know what i'm talking about so i'll make that perfectly clear um i would have thought that the universe would not optimize So what I mean by that is that if you've got a four by four tensor uh, and it will be 16 equations, it does all of them. There are no Bianchi identities in the universe, only to save mathematicians work so the universe is doing a lot of unnecessary calculations to yield no contribution to the end result and that's just how it is right that to me seems more conceptually elegant than having something where you take something that's four by four equals 16 and then you just go off and say let's try and you know eliminate some and then you get it down to 10 and you go okay i'll work with 10. so i'm thinking it might be 16. now that's why i was pursuing the whole thing about how could you then have it work because when it was 10 you're adding four to it if you have 16 plus four that's going to be 20. just so happens that that would be what would happen if you had d is equal to five um, and I wonder whether or not that extra dimension, that um, 4 plus 1, would be like R4 plus S1, that S1 might be <coughs> S1 is equal to A plus B I. And then you then have the complex numbers from that embedding of that circle. And then you pull that out and you um, use that when you're trying to make your theory and you need it to give it that C. Um, but I don't know because it's 16, isn't it? So it's going to be, um, it's going to lead it to be U, um, U, U, 512, 512, I think it was. 
Um, so that could be a thing. Now, does it need to be square rooted? Because um, we didn't bother not square rooting. I mean, if we were living in a reality that was squared, what difference does it make? Does it change physics if our model of reality that is Einstein, is it, if it's Einstein squared? <coughs> I suppose we would be, I mean, hold on a minute. We're not looking to square root the Yang Mills, are we? That's second order anyway. We leave that alone. So we leave that alone, that is how that is. The question is, is as we work our way back through the chimeric fiber bundle, is there a point where we need to knock down the number of dimensions? There isn't, you can't square root 512, can you? Um, I just don't think you can. Actually, let's have a look. I haven't got a calculator that does square root, have I? Um, I go 16 times. It's 256 from 16. Okay, so I don't see it's very promising as if it's going to do it. Um, could there be another universe? Could you split everything of your group and then have a T symmetry and then have the T symmetry make it be so that it was you 256, 256. Um, would that even work? And then having done that, would that then become and if you square root it, would it then be 16, 16? But you don't want it to be that low anyway. No, that's not, that's not useful. Um, not useful. Okay, I've let my, my mind run on, and I was thinking, well, I've put enough into this that if anything's going to come up, it's going to come up now, yeah? So, um... This is like the, the tail end of the theory here where he's doing this and it's like to be maximally suggestive of the kind of square root unification we have in mind. So this is like where he's going in the future and it's like, okay. So we're at equation uh, 12.10 and we will get that page in here which is 58 and put that in the chat and then we will um if anyone wants to read it and then there's the thing about the equations oh there was this this was the 12.7 and so this is the uh, equation 12.7 um which is the um, self-dual Young-Mills equation. So-called. And I think this is the thing he um, thinks he came up with. Um, and I think this here means it's chiral. And I think the one that um, Witten's got where it's just plus is because it's um no no say that again the plus minus means it goes both left and right plus means it goes left minus means it goes right um so Witten's version only goes left and it's to do with su2 and 
they were having problems with SU2 calculations and they said, can we make it so that we can calculate them in terms of U1? And so that was the gauge revolution was to take things that were tricky in SU2 and put them in terms of SU1, I think. And it made it easier. So um, we've got two things that are equal to zero. Um, now are they ordinarily in that form? I'm going to have to look up the caustic um, thing. And I don't know where it is. Oh, it might be in my files. Oh, hold on a second. Um, He's it, this guy uh, who did the critique. He's not the only one to do a critique. There's this one as well by Stefan H. Mays. And he was like much more constructive about it. Um, though I didn't really understand everything he was saying. Um, where are we with this? I want I want to find the thing. Why did it go so small? I want to just find the um, I'm looking for caustic. Only I don't really know how to spell caustic. I'm assuming it's in here. It might be in, um, it could be in the comments. It probably is in the comments. Oh, there it is. Look, there it is. So um, the bit that's in relevance is here, new gauge theory. So we want to compare that with the um, mm, what happened to the thing? Where is the thing? This, okay. So we want to do a comparison between these two things. And we have two on this side. And so the lower one is similar, right? It's F A plus. And the other one on the right is um, F plus or minus A. Well, that's been made equal to zero. Now, there's a difference between um, phi terms and psi terms and things like that, which he mentioned on Joe Rogan Experience. Um, and then this thing goes D star A F of A equals zero. Uh, I'm not seeing anything similar that much there. Um, although, oh uh, no, no, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing that it's that like it really. Because you're thinking that if it's going to be like the, um, curvature equation, right? then it would be probably, um, you'd, you'd be expecting that it would be like a vacuum field equation with it in terms of zero. Now, let's see what it says. Uh, 
the Yuan connection on A on L together with the levy derivative connection of the Riemannian metric induced covariant derivative. Clifford multiplication defines a Dirac operator D. That's a Dirac operator. So that would be the right hand side. Yeah. And then a positive spinner. So presumably this is the left hand side. So FA minus that would be equal to DA um hmm that's already equal to zero oh I know what you could do right right okay let's try writing this in um this is probably going to be completely wrong but we'll have to have a crack at it at least all right so this on the left we're going to go and say this one's direct and this one's a curvature which we could say is einstein And we're going to say this is happening in 14 dimensions. And we're going to say that the Dirac is equal to the T, nu nu, which is a stress energy momentum tensor. Right. Now, we take that and we take that away from there. We turn that into a minus. I don't really have to do very much, actually. We just go and get white and be incredibly lazy. And then turn that into a minus. And then all I have to do is that is having taken that away from that if that was equal to that then if i take it away it would be equal to naught right yeah so we'll do that and then i'm going to copy the whole thing over this side so we're going to go down the bottom there and we're going to go and make ourselves a comparison we're going to have a red line between the two of these and on the left we've got um, F plus and minus A right we're going to write it more like it, so we're going to say F plus of A, and then we're going to go subtract rather than equal to. And we're going to say I, which might be the imaginary unit, and that looks like sigma. And then we're going to have two of these. Now these might have been written differently they might have been written like that we're not going to worry about that for now we're going to keep to how he has it and um, that's equal to zero that's because it was equal to it was those two were equal and then if i Right, if I have A equals B, and then I take B away from this side, and B away from this side, that's a still an equation, and it ends up being A minus B 
is equal to zero. Yeah, that checks out. So we've got one in terms of zero, and the other one was already in terms of zero. So the other one, which is um, DA thing, which is DA this equals zero. Then we have an opportunity, don't we? Because we can put that in the place of that. So let's do that. <clears throat> uh, we don't want to do that. Um, not unless we rub it out. Um, um, we'll have to undo it. Right, get back to this. So that wasn't a zero, and then we want this to be a DA phi, or whatever that is. Is that phi in that side? I can't remember. Um, okay, so this is more like that's the tensor. And that's the curvature. Because this is the mass term. That's a curvature term. Right. Now, how does this relate to um but we now need to turn this into a vacuum one. We're not done yet. I don't want to let me wrap it out. Terrible. Okay. That seems all right. So that's now in the form of a vacuum equation. And now we'll um, need the, um, we'll need the Einstein field equation thing that we've got back in, where the hell it's got to here. We're going to put that in as well. It's going to be our new new minus a half um, r g new new. Probably skip out on the gravitation the, the constant that's constant and then this. But it, we want it to be zero, so we're going to take that away. We're going to reduce that to k. I have T mu nu is also equal to zero. So these two things are now equal to zero here. And this is going to be Yang Mills minus um, Higgs in terms of the. Well, hold on a minute. No, that's, they said that was a Dirac. Oh, interesting. That's weird. They said that was Dirac. How did I miss that? Compositing this with Clifford multiplication defines a Dirac operator. Dirac operator. Interesting. Um, I 
I don't understand what the direct operator is doing up there. Shouldn't it be the Higgs operator that's there? Do we swap all these things around? Do we make it so that the Higgs term is in here and the direct operator is up there? Don't know. Don't know. There's something going on with this where. So to do this, he would, in order to do a square root of this, you can't. So you'd have to do a square of this. Then you make them equal to tables. And then you go up and after you've got your term out, you then need to do square root that. Because all the terms in that are sending diagonal squared. Hmm. That's why you then rearrange everything back to being on the right sides of the equation. Okay, I have nothing more to say on that. So, um, there's anything else to say? Oh, there are the instances. So, um, the equations. Here we go. So, in geometric unity, we believe that the Einstein, Dirac, Yang Mills, and Klein Gordon equations for, okay, let's get this straight. For the metric, right, so that would be G mu nu. The thing going into the bottle, it would be the bottle part of that. Oh, you don't think it, the, the, the ship going into the bottle. He's making it so that this part here that is not got the G terms, that part is being done in terms of Yang Mills. Is that what he's doing? So he has that if this is the bottle and these are G new new terms that are making it have a metric, then the curvature He's like saying, if it was unified, then the curvature that you get on X4 or X13, when it's got the metric, will be the same as it is on the Y. So it's the same thing. So you can substitute in, in place of the Einstein equations, the Yang-Mills equations. Is that what he's doing? Is he not using the Ryman stuff, but he's using the Arismanian stuff? And then he's taking that, and he has that as his um, curvature equations, and then he has to then, um, in bringing it in, those R terms come from terms in the yang Mills. Oh, 
Onda. It would make more sense if that was what was going on. So that, the Einstein provides the metric, the Dirac is the fermions, Yang-Mills is the internal forces, the bosons, Higgs sector um, is the klein gordon right? The Higgs sector is mass. Does that have anything to do with stress, energy, momentum, tensor? Or is that also tied in with the Dirac? So that on the right hand side of the equation is that's where you have your fermionic stuff. And then the curvature is more tied into the bosons. So it's bosons equals fermions. It'd be interesting if there was supersymmetry and it was bosons equals fermions where the bosons gained a metric and in doing so reified into fermions. I mean, no, they didn't verify into fermions. There's a field elsewhere that got pulled through into our dimension because the because of the direct doing its stuff to make to give us some momentum from. from a field like the Higgs. You have one thing where things are described in terms of Higgs and bosonic fields, and then down here seems to be fermionic fields. But then it says in the diagram, it's standard model invasive stuff. So um, I think I'd have to look at all the subscripts that he's using for all the different things to then be sure well, look at that. There's going to be a diagram somewhere of that. So what we're looking for is the, I think it's the other way, the opposite diagram, oh, which we've got on here, but I rubbed out everything which was there. There we go. Okay. Um, that's no help. I need to know the um, there's a table and everything's written to the table. There you are. Um, this is five point one. Oh, it's not sort of fire illustration 5.1. Right. Uh, bosons and fermions. The fermions are half and a third, and they're in, I think, zeta. Um, right. And it says both of these things were on Y. Hmm. Why is one that says zero and the other one say one? Huh. And it says one of them is a spinner on the left, on the right hand column, they're spinners. <coughs> they're spinners because they are fractional. Right, okay, those are fractional spinners, so they're, um, there's three, two, um, it's a half, and 
Oh, right, okay, gotcha. <sighs> and then the add value would be the bosons, which would presumably be one of them would be the Higgs, so that um, epsilon would be the Higgs, and the alternative omega would be the uh, vector bosons, so that could be quarks. Right, gotcha. Now, um, oh, I see, I see. So in the diagram, it says chai. Is that is that for the, for getting hold of the fermions? Is that chai here? The chai he's using in the di diagram where it's this chai is that the same chai for fermions but why would it be going in this way with fermions you're saying that the fermions are interacting with you are you the matter stuff Gravitation, matter, is affecting this. I mean, I don't know. Is it that stuff has to go like in a circuit? And so you're saying matter is being transported into you, into, sorry, into like why? But it makes it look like it's being transported into the group. No, I don't know. These nitty gritty details are um, I, I'm not following it. Not following it. So what we'll do is we will begin um, our um, stream. Um, let us begin. So how are we doing for time? Well, it's only been six hours, so um, let us begin. Hopefully that person's not going to be banging nails in the whole time. Um, uh, we'll put it down here. It does sound like he's going to be banging in all the time. That's unfortunate. Um, Right, maybe he'll put, put his pictures up quickly. So we'll just wait for them. So let me see if I can leave my song. It does sound like it's gonna be bringing in all the time. Alright, we'll be off we'll be fine. Um this is we'll close this out. And it says I think it's a theory of everything. And shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have said that. And then what else have we got here? Um, geometric unity. And then we want to have the, that is the portal special presentation. And then we want to have that on the right hand side of the screen. And then we want to have the, um, we can close this now. We want to have the, um, ooh, we want to have the transcript of stuff.
well, we've had this happen, where we've had the um, new scientists say that it's a do of everything, so that doesn't help matters. Um, and he wasn't claiming it was that at the time. Um, he didn't say it was a theory of everything. At the introduction to his lecture, in the lecture, or in the supplementary side explainer, or in the paper published in 2021. And then he goes on Joe Rogan and ruins it. So, um, um, I'm looking for, would it be easy to do it through Windows? I'm looking for the portal. Portal. Portal transcripts. Portal special presentation. It's not there. It's not there, or is it there? Doesn't look like it's there. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, I don't think we need to even have that on screen anymore. Um, but we will probably need the names. So we leave that uncovered. And then we'll see about the rest of this. We're going to go and open up another window and we'll find it from scratch. So portal. Has he finished? No, we don't want this. We want to have portal. Geometric Unity, we want to go here, Lecture Transcript, then we want to go to the Lecture, there, go sync ourselves up, and, oh, I wanted it nice and big, so it could be red. I think this is going to be needed to go in this way. It's problematic because I kind of like to. That's not too bad. That's all right. That's okay. Right, I think we're all right. So we're going to. We're going to start, and it's um, 10 o'clock. So we'll do it in, what, five minutes? Five minutes. It starts at 10 o'clock. Um, We could cover the introduction. Well, welcome to this um, special Simone lecture. And my name. It's all this noise.
Well, welcome to this um, special Simone lecture. Uh, my name is Mark Spasotoy. I'm a professor of mathematics here and the Simone professor for the public understanding of science. And Charles Simone prepared a manifesto when he endowed this chair to guide the holder of the professorship in their mission. And I'd like to read one part of that manifesto to you. Um, it said, scientific speculation, when so labelled, and when the concept of speculation and its place in the scientific method has been made clear to the audience, can be very exciting. It is a very effective communication tool, and it is by no means discouraged. And it is in the spirit of this part of my mission as a Simone professor that I would like to introduce today's Simone special lecture. I first met Eric Weinstein when we were both postdocs at the Hebrew University just over 20 years ago. And I had the feeling then that he was working on something big. But it wasn't until two years ago that Eric met me in a bar in New York and we began, he began to explain the mathematics that he'd been working on in private for the last 20 years. As he took me through the equations he had been formulating, I began to see emerging before my eyes potential answers to many of the major problems in physics. It was an extremely exciting, daring proposal and also mathematically so natural that it started to work its magic on me. Over the last two years, I have had the privilege of being taken through the twists and turns of Eric's ideas. After our postdocs in Israel, while I went the academic route, getting my professorship here in Oxford, Eric went a more independent route, working in economics, government, and finance. So he comes here today as something of an insider and an outsider. A difficult place to, to propose bold ideas. But having spent time seeing how powerful these ideas appear to be, I felt that it was time that Eric shared his ideas more widely, as I believe his perspective could give the scientific community a new story to explain some of the big questions on the scientific books. I'm therefore very happy to provide a platform here in Oxford for Eric to share his ideas on a new theory he calls geometric unity. The lecture will be approximately 70 minutes after which we will have um, a period to ask questions. Eric. All right, I'm going to listen to this. A difficult place for the proposed bold ideas. But having spent time seeing how powerful these ideas appear to be, I felt that it was time that Eric shared his ideas more widely, as I believe his perspective would give the scientific community a new story to explain some of the big questions. Don't know quite how to position the microphone for this. The noise out in the road, and the noise from the wall there. Um, I'll just have to put up with it, I think. So I don't know quite what to do. Um, this tab is sharing your screen, memory usage. How about not showing that? Okay. Gosh, what can he be banging? When, when do you think he's going to be finished banging? And it's from Monday. I mean, you know, I want you at work. Well, ready to start at 10 o'clock. I've got a chaffing bird. There we go. So, um, start. So, it's a, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, it is possible that no other university in the world has kept so tightly uh, and kept the faith for so long with uh, Einstein's great vision of 
a final theory for physics as a theory of pure geometry. Sort of what the hell? And simplicity of the highest order. And the names that are associated with Oxford. He's drilling now. We will go back a bit. <laughs> this, 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 uh, the, the whole thing of me doing this. Um, I've had like six hours in the night. It was really quiet. And I was, it was fantastic. And I could have done it then. But I was like, explaining how to do unification and I came into this fully committed to like I will start and I will immediately start play you know and it's like you know, I, I seem to have completely lost the knack and then someone turns up in chat and they're like saying do you believe in God and I'm like uh oh, God I'm gonna have to talk to them that all ends up being a major detour. They can't have just drilled one hole. They're going to want to drill another one, aren't they? Because they're putting up shells or something. <coughs> Come on, drill another hole. How, shall, how long shall I give them? Another minute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See. Oh. He's obviously got a new drill. He's doing all the drilling that he ever wanted to drill. You know, like there's a hole here, there's a hole there. I suppose I could eat my biscuits and not care about the noise, couldn't I? Because, I mean, I'm thinking about the microphone with the biscuits, but it doesn't matter with this guy on.
I think he's moved to draw in another part of the house. All right. I'm going to try putting it on. So it's a, well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, it is possible that no other university in the world has kept so tightly uh, and kept the faith for so long with uh, Einstein's great vision of a final theory for physics as a theory of pure geometry, a sort of elegance and simplicity of the highest order. And the names that are associated with Oxford Eric. So it's a, well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, it is possible that no other university in the world has kept so tightly uh, and kept the faith for so long with uh, Einstein's great vision of a final theory for physics as a theory of pure geometry. That's an all right audio level. Okay, let's get going. At uh, way heavy on me are Atia, Penrose, Siegel, Woodhouse, Hitchin, a very long list of people who, uh, even when fashion uh, did not hold those ideas in favor, uh, always kept the faith that there was much to be learned from the geometric perspective on physics. Of course, unified field theory, in some sense, acquired a stigma with Einstein's failure to find it in the sense that even someone like Einstein uh, being tempted by the siren song of geometry uh, might lose their footing and go astray. And in the years since, we've had a replacement theory, which is that what is really calling our generations is the, is the quest to quantize general relativity and gravity. And I'd like to, to go back to the sort of earlier perspective that um, there's no evidence to date in my mind, that we are being called to quantize general relativity directly. Uh, so in fact, there's been more effort what, spent on that quest. What is being meant by this? So to quantize, the quest to quantize general relativity and gravity, all right? Um, so we have quantum um, field theories and they have um image unity and we want to look at the part of the theory where it is we bring it down this way might be a bit thin and we're going to go we can always zoom in on it and we're going to go to um where in the document is it It's talking about, it's 12.10. So it's just in the section here, um, here, right? So this bit here, gravitons, can I not cut highlight that? Where it says gravitons there, Um, it's a bit small. Hmm. Can I not make that bigger? Oh, I can. That's quite nice. All right, that's all right. So, when they think there's spin two, the assumption is I think they want to add to the groups and they want to make it so that it has um, more um, uh, gauge groups and in that they'll have 
their gravitons. Because I've been reading up on string theory a little bit, and it seems as if some of it is tied into gauge theory. And I was surprised, I don't know why, but um, it seems as if you get to gauge theory um, that way. Let's just see if I can hear what's going on. I think they want to add to the groups and they want to make it so that it has um, more um, um, gauge groups and in that they'll have their gravitons. Because I've been reading up on string theory a little bit and it seems as if some of it is tied into gauge theory. And I was surprised, I don't know why, but um, it seems as if you get to gauge theory um, that way. Let's just see if I can hear. It's so, not terrible. It's quite loud. To make it so that it... Um, I, um, I don't think it's like as bad as it um, might be. I think it's quite loud behind me, but there's not anything I can do about it. The kitchen door's closed. Um... I'll wait for him to finish um, for now. I could have that on the same tab, couldn't I? And then switch tabs, that would be the most efficient thing to do. Put that there and then have this be um, and that needs to be smaller. That fits the whole width, and then we go back to this. <coughs> Hump tight start, yeah. This is just that introduction anyway. He's probably going to stop drilling by the time he gets to the main meat of the thing. Feels like he's going to make a hole through the wall into my house. Anyway, it's always been very quiet here. It's not been a problem with noise. You know, they don't have parties. And um, I suppose I could go and get some crisps. Good night. Eat some crisps. Have something to eat that's noisy. And then... Uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll set myself and, uh, what we've got here. I'll look on those, okay. Those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I'm getting the sneaky suspicion he might have stopped. Has he stopped?
Okay. It's time to say that fellas have done tempting fate. Well, oh, it's going to start. The sun's coming in. It's going to probably make the computer shut down. Um. Turn the radiators off more than we already are. Where are we with this? Okay. Let's see what we're doing with this. If my computer shuts down, that's not too bad. This is a reasonable heat coming out less than it was when it was having trouble before um well what i'll do i'll bring the keyboard forward generations is the, is the quest oh dear it's coming up on seven hours so Might as well noisily eat my crisps. It says three watching. Who's the three people watching? Is it me? If I'm one. But well, I'm watching, I'm watching. So there's one more. Well, I've got an audience. This can't be very interesting. I'm trying to wait for the neighbor to stop drilling. Mm. You stay up all night doing this. And you think, well, it's going to be nice and quiet. So you do it at some ungodly hour and then you spend hours in a kind of preamble
So, yeah. Well, it's been half an hour of a hiatus. I don't think it's very good. Um, I don't think what to do. I mean... This question is off topic from physics. We deal with mainstream physics here. Questions about the general correctness of unpublished personal theories are off topic. Well, oh, it's asked two, two years, ten months ago. Uh, For more information, see is non-mainstream physics appropriate? It edited found by me. Really? Asked by an anonymous user and edited by me. Hmm. What did I do? I had wondered whether Mitchell Porter was Eric.
I can't remember being involved in this and what my edit was. What was it before? The first version of it was, I can usually follow the basics ideas of a theory, but Feinstein's geometric unity theory is completely incomprehensible to me. It leads me to suspect that it is high level crack pottery, but he seems to be respected. Does anyone actually understand what he's getting at and does he have any actual equations that predict? Um, something or do something. Then this person goes and says, I can usually follow the basic idea of a theory, but, and then they remove Weinstein's geometric unity theory. Well, how is that a change? What have they done to change it? Has they made it a link? They've made it a link. It wasn't a link before, now it's a link. I see. Added to the eight characters. Now what? What did I do? Right, this is the bit I did. What did this person do there? These look identical. Or well, maybe the tags got edited. Oh, he edited the tags. He took off all the tags. So it was the same theory of everything, unified theories and topology got removed. The topology here, they took off topology and added these two. They took off all the tags. Wow. It should have the unified theories on there. Um, This link was to a general Google search. So someone just typed into Google geometric unity rather than anything specific. Michael and Cizo's impression of the 2013 lecture helped convey the fact that Eric Weinstein's speculative ceremony lecture was well received and he did have positive technical feedback directly afterwards. So I linked to the paper. I think. Okay. So I did my bit. What have we got here? This is Peter White. Well,
Now what to do now? This is now been forty-five minutes. That's quite reasonable. I see, so there weren't that many people in the audience that were physicists called according to this. Maybe invited no mathematicians, or I didn't know anyone to invite. Uh, Well, there were slides in the lecture.
What? He seems he's more interested in getting attention than in contributing to science. He can go fuck himself. Right, it stands corrected, that's a little bit better. Okay, so we've got that. Um, Be Timothy Wynn, I think. Well, we're gonna go into Reddit, are we? So, we look at the Eric Weinstein story. Okay. Jennifer Ouellette's uh, husband is Sean Carroll. Really? No, really? So she's the one that said nasty things about Eric. Oh dear. Wow. There's something going on then. There's something going on because these are string theory guys. He's going up against the string theory guys by having an alternative. They have bad blood with him over um, their Lord and Saviour Whitten. Mm -hmm. And then she uh, puts the boot in with her article, which is um, Dear Garden, you've been played to the scientific American because the Americans don't like. Um, this is it. I've not read this before. Uh, you've met him. Right, supported by Frankel. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Why's your ball to it? The deck's not working that day. There have been no advances in physics since 1974. So it is newsworthy when someone has a new theory of physics. I mean, you can wait two years if you want, or more, eight years. Wait eight years, then report the news. That will presumably, you know, find out the results of the 2020 election in 2028. Marcus de Soto manipulated the Guardian. The Guardian, a bunch of fools, left his fools, so who cares? Oh dear. he's doing there I mean what can he possibly be drilling so many holes for do you think he's hanging a TV on the wall and they're getting all the holes in the wrong place I mean it looked really nice when it's finished What's he doing? Why is he needing to drill so much? They're hoping to find some oil. It's coming up to an hour now. I thought he'd be done. So they cocked up with the attendees because the email was not widely circulated. Um, why? Sotoy did in fact invite Oxford physicists sending an email to their department along with A3 posters. Unfortunately, no one spotted the talk because the email was not widely circulated or advertised on the internal web page. Right, so that means the head of department fucked them over. So he is the Simone funded uh, chair for the public understanding of science. He gets to have a lecture hall in which he can invite people. And the person who's running the show, when he says, I'm getting a guest in, make sure no one gets to go by not telling anyone. But so it's like luck if anyone shows up in the room. So that means that he was doing it for the cameras and the audience might not have even understood what he was doing. Now there's a talk of the caller post by um, Marco Anciso, which says that he it was well received and he talked to um physicist at the end maybe that was a different day he, he was talking about the May uh, 23rd talk so I think it was the same day uh -huh. 
So, right, so you're you're saying that um, there needs to be a technical paper for there to be a dialogue. He made it quite clear that it was a speculative lecture. That's what the Simone thing is all about, is to have speculative ideas presented. So if you don't like that, the fuck off. The thing is, it's a work in progress. Lots of it is yet to be figured out. And like, you could have a hand in giving feedback now, or you could leave him to wrestle with it, and he might give up on it. But you probably think your idea is better anyway, so you better go off and be quiet and work on that. But don't tell anyone about it until you've done a paper, because that's the way, that, that's the rules, right? That's the rules. You can't tell anyone until you've got the paper, and then you have to go through peer review with it. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's going at a snail's pace. It's all about power and who gets to say who gets to publish. And I think most of the things people end up writing are there to put, uh, impress their professor and get on the, his good side and that sort of thing. So it's a kind of, like, at my father's art college, it turned out that the students would make artwork that was like their uh, teachers. Like, what's the point in going to art college if you end up just imitating the style of your tutor? Just to get on his good side and get good scores. Because he's a fucking narcissist, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really see that it would be any different with physics. That's what the whole cult of personality around witness. Everyone's chasing after witness the strings and they're not breaking away and doing other things unless they're like um, Lee Smolin and he got sick of it and did loop quantum gravity. I'm going to be um, putting this on at 11. Uh, it's, I can't wait any longer. It's been like an hour. Well, I might, I might give it five more minutes. Give it five more minutes.
Okay, I have a theory um, that the neighbour is having a kitchen put in. That's probably it. There's like a white van outside. So that would account for the noise. So it's going to go on a long time. Because I like the connecting all the units to the wall, probably. So um, what I'm going to do is um it's been an hour of noise another noisy drilling uh, so um ending now pick up when it is quiet um probably tonight and I'm going to do a stream of um, Call of Duty. And um, we'll go along with that. And when I do this, I will be reacting to this, um, going back to when he first starts to speak, which will be there about and we'll leave it there i think it's unfortunate so we better end the stream now that's seven and a half hours i had wanted to get the whole thing done um it's um we've got someone putting in the kitchen um i've seen the van outside and uh next door neighbors having a kitchen put in 
they're usually very quiet and I had done most of the stream um, in the night um, and now it's getting into daytime and it's getting noisy now so no no good so I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna have a relatively short noisy stream of Call of Duty and then I'm going to um, have a rest and then I'm going to see about some dinner and then I'm gonna see about maybe resuming because they can't be working after six can they so when I've had my dinner um, I can come on later and hopefully um, they won't be having like a housewarming there with people having a party all night so we're going to end the stream there um, that's I don't I've lost track of how many individual videos I've made where I've set out with the intention to cover this uh, lecture and for one reason or another I've not got close to it and um, I really 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 set out with the intention to uh, do it today and last night and I was thinking yeah I'll just go very very short introduction go straight into it and I couldn't manage it somehow I got derailed immediately and because the thing is I'd, I'd done this image and I just thought I kind of quite a good image I'll have that for the thumbnail and I thought there's the thumbnail but it's too small to appreciate so I thought I'll oh, just give a little kind of a tour around the image with the fact I can zoom in and stuff and talk through it all and it'll be a nice introduction to the talk so that obviously already takes time doing that and I've covered stuff about this in previous stream but I just feel that people might not have watched all the videos uh, why would they because they're all so long so I just thought put that again and Every time I do it, I get a bit more fluent, a bit more practiced at what I'm saying. And um, but again, I get into deeper topics as well. And I am um, finding it hard to kind of work certain things out about what he's doing uh, because I'm going into areas where I don't know. Um, I don't know what he's doing. And there's always going to be that with what is, you know, with geometric unities. It's like the stuff I know, the stuff I can articulate with, within what I know, and then there's the stuff which is um, at the limit of my understanding, and then the stuff that is beyond my understanding. And then when I get to the things that are at the limit, I then start to understand a bit more, and I can go beyond that uh, into stuff I didn't know before. But um, it was like a mainly new stuff for the quantum field theory side of things and the groups. And then, because it's quite nice, it's kind of like patterns. And that's because I'd come to it from uh, Garrett Lisi's Exceptionally Simple Theory of Everything. And then this was, um, um, this has got a lot of stuff that is to do with general relativity. And I know next to nothing about it. And I need to research it. Well, what I just read about Jennifer Gwillette um, being married to Sean Cowell and sort of dunking on Eric, I was like, really? And I thought, why does she need to be like that? Because she's like criticising the, the Guardian. She said she likes him. But then she said, why did the Guardian even give him like a platform for his talk and everything and there is a definite idea suppression in academia because the soto is there for to be the public the guy for the public understanding of science he finds someone who's got a new theory that's different from string theory completely original He's someone who has got a degree, he's got a sorry, a degree, got a PhD in mathematical physics. So it's not like he is a nobody or a crank. 
He does what he's talking about. It checks out mathematically. He thinks it'd be interesting to share, but it would be in the framing of it being a speculative lecture. He happens to be someone who had Charles Simone fund the chair for the public understanding of science and say it's important that people, you know, see speculative lectures and know that they are speculation, right? And he's all for that. It's like, right, okay, good. This is what this will be. It's not going to be presented as a theory or a theory of anything. And then what happens? Next day, new scientist says, controversial new theory of everything. They can go fuck themselves. They're the ones calling it that. And then you get Jim Ali Khalili or something in The Guardian, and he all goes nasty about it. And it's like, okay, what's your issue with it? Well, I don't really know what to say because I haven't really looked at it that carefully. And like, well, you don't have a fucking opinion on it then, do you, mate? Right? Just shut the fuck up. Why can't people just ignore it? Right? If they have such a problem with the fact he's doing it outside of academia, just ignore him. Right? Because he doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. You have made yourselves irrelevant. You have not done anything new in science since 1974. Right? You are completely irrelevant in terms of theoretical physics. So, it could be that what he's doing is a complete waste of time. It could be that it's actually going to pay off. But you're not doing anything to help him. And... If you think he's irrelevant, just stay silent. And I think you're all irrelevant. So I'm, I don't have any time for anything that you're saying. See how you like them onions. I mean, I was purely interested in it. Because I thought, I wonder what one of these things might look like. Because I had seen the shape of a grand unified theory. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. But I'd never seen something where it was like quantum and general relativity combined. And I thought, how would you do that? And I'd never looked into string theory at all. So them doing supergravity and stuff like that and managing something of uh, unification, but it not making any predictions. I just thought, okay, but with this, it's, I just, I just thought it might not be anything that connects to reality, but I just thought it'd be interesting to see what it would look like. How, how, you know, how much there would be to it for it to be what it was. And there's a lot, there's an awful lot. It's, it's been like three years of me reading up on it nearly every day and learning more and more. And it's been very interesting. And it's not been like leading me into the wrong areas because it's all really quite traditional stuff he's put, building it out of. All the things that everyone's been building these series out of for all this time is the stuff that he's been using to make his. He's just sort of unwound certain things a little bit. Uh, like everything's very tightly knotted and he's like saying, well, let's just undo a few of these rather tight knots here and loosen things up and say, do we really need this and this? Oh, we can actually tie this to this now because they're now loose. And we have problems in this theory and problems in this theory. We will get those things to, um, you know, um, solve each other's issues so you know kind of like a marriage you know like both people are lonely by themselves and they cook and they eat too much because they always make too much food and then they hook up and they're no longer lonely and they're making just the right amount of food they don't have to cook all the time but they take it in turns to cook and 
they both like different, slightly different types of food. You know, they like cooking slightly different types of food, so that means they have variety, whereas before they didn't. And it's nice to not have to cook, but it's also nice to cook for someone who appreciates what you cook. It's, it's like that, you know. It's a marriage. Geometric unity is like a marriage. So I'm going to stop now and probably pick it up later today. Um, and I'm going to stream um, again just because I'm like annoyed because of what's going on here.